Unfortunately, good news in the labor market can be bad news because the Fed will have to respond more. This isn't really going to significantly change the trajectory of the Fed. We've heard from the Fed that we are likely to be higher and tighter for longer. That was the core messaging from Jackson Hole. There will not be rate cuts in 2023. I think the Fed's telling us there's going to be pain. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Grammo's back. That's the headline. That's the good news. <laughs> Live from New York City. That's where the good news ends. And now for our audience bad. worldwide. Good morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with the wonderful Lisa Bram. It's back in the seat. Futures up Thanks. six tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. TK, after the long weekend, we hit the ground running. We hit the ground running. In fact, I was watching the markets over the weekend, John. It's absolutely extraordinary. We could spend the entire show just on foreign exchange. Things are moving. The news flow is extraordinary. We've got to talk about the earnings too. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley cutting his earnings forecast, yeah. Tom. Bottom line, here's the quote. We think the next several quarters will end up containing some of the most significant downward revisions to forward EPS forecasts we have seen in the past several cycles. Yeah, I like what he says. He says we cut EPS further. That's all there is to it, and he bets down on that. I think we're going to see a lot of that, John, frankly, going both ways. I would expect some of the bulls to go the other way. Ben Laidler to join in moments of pushes against Mike Wilson's tone. Hard to be bullish right now. More lockdowns in China. Energy issues over in Europe. I think we can call it an energy crisis, Lisa. We've yes, been doing that for yeah, a while. Absolutely. And now we're starting to see the relief, the plans, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger from European governments. So the question that a lot of people are raising is, have we seen the bottom? Because right now we're seeing every worst-case scenario play out, whether it's the lockdowns in China that are escalating ahead of the uh, of the confab later this year for the party, uh, the Congress. How much do we see the energy shutdowns in Europe continuing and getting worse? Have we seen the bottom of this all getting priced in, or have we not recognized that this is a worst-case scenario of a confluence of a pretty uh, severe st uh, number of things? Worst case is the base case. How much worse can it get? Have you seen some of the forecasts on the foreign exchange side of things? Yes. We've got a euro dollar call from Jordan Rochester over Namora looking at 90, 90 cents yeah. on euro dollar. <laughs> this from City. This is before we had the plans from Liz Truss, and let's see if we even get those plans in reality. But cable over at City could fall to 105 to 110. Yeah. These are some monster calls in foreign exchange. We're talking about more people calling for parity for the pound, not just the euro, for the pound because of some of these proposals and this concern that uh, Deutsche Bank's George Saravellos raised over the weekend of a flight of foreign investors not willing to fund a deficit at a time when Liz Truss talked about tax cuts while also increasing expenditures. How does this really play out when you need to really develop some of the foreign investor base? Matt Miller put it well earlier this morning, Tom, when he talked about 75 basis point hikes. It's not just the Fed. We're looking well, ahead to the ECB, perhaps getting that on Thursday, looking ahead to the Bank of England, perhaps getting it that from them too. After I heard from Catherine Mann, a speech from her just yesterday, Tom. Tell you what, that teed up a big move yeah, from the BOE. The, the man was real simple. The acclaimed economist of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, of course, her work at Citigroup. And, John, she said the rope is fraying on the anchored expectations uh, tone. John, the best research note this morning, no surprise, comes from Mr. Nabarro over at Citigroup. You remember him, 18% inflation, I believe, was the splash he made six weeks ago. The fiscal proposals of Prime Minister Trust are 8 they are the same amount of cash call as the last eight years combined. Lisa called it. You wonder Stunning. whether we start to see some tension in the bond market off the back of some of these plans. I'd argue we've already seen signs of it over the last month. If you're just tuning in this morning, good morning. Let's hit the ground running this Tuesday morning. Futures bouncing back six tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100 up seven tenths of one percent. <coughs> Yields higher on a 10 year by let's call it six basis points. 324.81 on a 10 year. Crude just a little bit softer down two tenths of one percent here. Bramo 86. 72. Yeah, the focus very much in Europe, full front and center. That is where the crisis is. That is where the change in leadership is over in the United Kingdom. Liz Truss is expected to deliver a speech possibly around 1130 a.m. Eastern time from Towning, 10 Downing Street. Perhaps she will outline her plan for a 130 billion pound issue. How do you support some of the household budgets and freeze energy bills where they are rather than allowing them to climb? What you are seeing in the pound is a little bit of a reprieve of a direct downward trend. How much do you get a real feeling of concern about this spending? 
spending plan, especially without any plans to raise money at a time of such a dire projection for the UK economy. Today in the United States, the Senate returns after the Labor Day holiday. They're going to be talking about a lot of issues, confirmations of judges trying to get back uh, rolling after a month recess. How much is gas still full front and center? It continues gasoline, uh, petrol, in your words, John. It continues to decline for yet another set of days. It has been something near 80 days straight of declines in the uh, price of oil. How much does this really give some support to the Democrats heading into the midterm elections? We have just nine weeks until uh, those elections. And at 10 a.m., we get a bit of U.S. data, August ISM services index data getting released. How much do we see it continuing to come in? Some expectations are for it to come to the lowest levels going back to the peak of the pandemic. And John, this is the issue that we are not talking about. OPEC Plus actually reduced its uh, or increased uh, some of its production over the weekend, actually decreased, excuse me, some of its production because it's worried about the lack of demand globally out of China, out of the U.S. How much is that continue to be a theme heading into the winter? It's just a coincidence that after the G7 agrees an oil price cap on Russia that all of a sudden we get cuts from OPEC Plus and then you get the Nord Stream 1 pipeline getting shut down for good potentially. Well, but you're still getting oil prices go down. And if that to me says a lot, John, this is a concern about demand destruction, about demand falling off in the weakness of growth, not necessarily uh, a, a, a sort of supplies uh, coming offline. And that to me is fascinating. Lisa, thank you. We'll pick up on that story a little bit later this hour. Joining us now is Ben Laidler, global market strategist at eToro. Ben, it's your job to tell us how on earth you can be bullish in a moment like this. How can you be? I think you've just answered the question yourself, haven't you? when everyone's on this sort of race to the bottom of, you know, who can get more bearish, who can have the more outlandish sort of forecast. I think that just tells you where market psychology is right now. Uh, you know, sentiment, different ways to measure it. It's a global financial crisis lows. Um, and however bad you think this is, uh, that's not it. Um, the inflation fever, I think, is, is, beginning to, is beginning to break. You've got corporates, consumers that, uh, for now, are remaining remarkably resilient. It won't last forever. But um, it's, it's, it's the fact of the matter today. Uh, the U.S. economy is actually re-accelerating right now, right? Uh, it's not about to sort of plunge on in, into recession. We're having healthy right. jobs reports. We've got gasoline prices coming down. The consumer is going to end up with more money uh, in, uh, in, in their pocket. I mean, I could go on and on. I, I, I do think this is a, um, this is a market which, or, uh, which is talking itself into, into a funk and a little bit of less bad news, which is all you need, uh, I think goes a very long way from here. And then the research dump this morning is off the chart. I want to congratulate you on your ETF and passive uh, investment uh, research piece. It's just really extraordinary. But I got to stay on markets this morning. Buried in your note is a single line that the bond market is speaking. The bond market is saying companies are fine. Discuss that. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. I mean, I'm you know. We look at earnings, uh, I mean, earnings expectations, you talked about earlier, yeah, they're falling, but they're still 7 8%. They're still very healthy. Corporate profit margins are, uh, uh, yes, they're falling, but they're falling from sort of record levels. Um, default rates are absolutely, you know, record lows. Companies, you know, use the, the last crisis very well to sort of refinance. Um, and that's the message you're getting sort of loud and clear from, from the corporate bond market. Um, yes, spreads have widened. Yes, the weakest companies are finding it difficult to refinance. But spreads are very tight versus sort of historical levels. And I think, you know, we talk a lot, I mean, I'm, I'm the equity guy, but, you know, you're, you're getting these messages if you choose to look for them, and I'm not sure everybody is, uh, that are telling you that corporates are, you know, have been very nimble, are very resilient, have, you know, default rates are low, and, you know, they're, weather, they're ready to weather this slowdown that's coming. A lot of people, Ben, say that the corporate bond market isn't the same uh, weather vein that it used to be simply because of how much companies termed out some of their maturities. Looking at the bottom line, have we priced in the ramifications for U.S. companies from a deep European recession, which is becoming the base case for an increasing number of Wall Street firms? So what happens if you don't get a deep European recession? So, I mean, there are no good policy choices in, in Europe right now. But basically, every single government is going to come out with some gargantuan package to either cut, break the link between gas prices and electricity prices or cap those prices. And what's that going to do? That's going to soften the recession through the winter, and that's going to bring down inflation. Now, yes, that's going to store up sort of pain for further down, further down the line. But I actually think, again, in this sort of race to the bottom of market expectations, 
Uh, I think this sort of wall of money which is coming our way is going to do an awful lot to soften that, at least in the near term. But Ben, you're saying that basically fiscal support will come in if there is a deep recession. Who's going to finance that at a time where you're already seeing yields climb? Yeah, absolutely. Yields probably climb a little bit further, right? But these are still very, very low yields by any historical context. And we'll see. We'll see how high yields really go if inflation keeps coming. If inflation, you know, if I'm right that this inflation fever is breaking and inflation starts to come down and, um, and economies keep softening. I mean, we'll see how high bond yields really go. Ben Labour of eToro. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate your time. Tell you what, yields have been surging already, particularly in the United Kingdom at the front end, the two year. Just had its biggest monthly jump in yields. Lisa, on record, on record for the two-year in the UK. And you've been saying this. At what point are we having a risk premium getting baked in because of this concern about a fiscal deficit, deficit that foreign investors just will not fund? When does this become a, an increasing concern that leads to calls for IMF bailouts and all sorts of things? There was a Financial Times piece uh, just about that over the weekend. Well, listen to the numbers. The plans coming out of the UK, Tom, now totals about $170 billion. Sterling, yeah. just like that. I think the number for consumers right. to freeze energy bills is 130. Then the other plan po planned floated in the last 24 hours was a 40 billion sterling energy aid right. package for UK businesses. This stuff is adding yeah. up pretty quickly. And again, for Americans who go deep into the United Kingdom, like the farthest north they get is Harrods, I would say, John, that we forget how small the United Kingdom economy is. These are huge numbers on a per capita basis. Again, I go to Citigroup, which did a tour de force note this morning. The cash call in the gilt market is a combined eight years of previous commitments. It's not like the pandemic when the bond market was no, wide open for this stuff. No, this is very different. Stuff. Good point. This is very, very different. Futures up six tenths of one percent on the S&P. Coming up in the next hour, looking forward to catching up with Troy Gajewski of FS Investments. We'll do that in about 50 minutes' time. Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Good to be back. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Liz Truss officially becomes the UK's next Prime Minister today after winning the Conservative Party's leadership contest and she's drafting plans to aid households and businesses with their soaring energy bills. The proposals could cost close to $200 billion. The Justice Department is considering whether to appeal a judge's decision regarding documents seized from Donald Trump's home in Florida. The judge has granted the former president's request to have a special master, a neutral third party, review the papers. The judge, who was appointed during the Trump administration, also temporarily blocked the government from using the documents in its criminal investigation. A post-OPEC Plus rally has fizzled out. Oil fell a day after the cartel and its allies agreed to a modest 100,000 barrel a day cut. Further lockdowns in China are weighing on demand, so are higher interest rates and signs of a global slowdown. And Russia may face a longer and deeper recession as the impact of U.S. and European sanctions spreads. Bloomberg has viewed an internal report prepared for the Russian government. Two of the three scenarios in the report show a contraction accelerating next year. They see the economy returning to the pre-war level only at the end of the decade or later. And the drugstore chain CVS keeps expanding beyond its retail origins. The company has reached a deal to buy home health and technology services pro provider Signify Health for about $8 billion in cash. Other bidders included Amazon and United Health. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We need to show that we will deliver over the next two years. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have 
on energy supply. And we're starting to see the plans. That was Liz Truss, the incoming Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Look at these numbers. This from Javier Blas just moments ago. So we've got 130 billion plus another 40 billion. So 130 to freeze household energy bills. That's the plan. 40 billion for small business. That's the plan. That's 170 altogether. That equals the annual NHS budget. And it's about 5% of GDP. Tom, that's a massive that's really, proposal are, that's some great from this incoming Prime Minister. And thanks to Javier Blas for that yeah. tweet moments ago. The ratio analysis here, John, is really important. Very uh, quickly, John, I do want to point out that finally Renminbi near 7 yuan on a two standard deviation basis. We're almost there. We're just a little teen sweet so away, John. But a 7 yuan is a real benchmark. It's an interesting market this Tuesday yeah. morning. Let's whip through it briefly, Tom. Futures yeah. up by 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P on the NASDAQ 100, up 9 tenths of 1%. Yields a little bit higher, up four basis points on a 10 year, 3.2273. Euro dollar, let's call it unchanged. Right. Currency pair up about a tenth of 1%, Tom. Euro dollar mm. 99.38. A common feature of Labor Day weekend is Joe Matthew and I both quaff a six-pack of Narragansett lager beer. It is the beer of Rhode Island and of the Boston Red Sox. And the gentleman joins. How was your Narragansett lager beer this weekend, Joe? We like to call it the Baywaters where I come from and Baywater. sweet as ever, Tom. I'm glad that you're I'm glad. That oh, you're we can go true. on, but we don't have enough time. Well, I was in a fog <laughs> over Narragansett lager beer. I was trying to sort out a judge in Florida Mar-a-Lago, the president, and buried in the reports, including the Washington Post and Bloomberg, is the Justice Department has the right to appeal. What will appeals court say to a single federal judge appointed by the former president? Uh, maybe I'll see you in the Supreme Court, which uh, is, is that really where this, this is heading? May, this really may end up because there are questions yeah. about, okay, executive privilege. The, the, the court really hasn't come down on this exactly. Can the president, a former president in this case, invoke executive privilege against a sitting presidency? That's actually a big question that has yet to be answered. But apparently we are going forward with the special master, if only to slow things down. That can, in fact, be a legal strategy that we've seen before from Donald Trump, remembering there was already a team doing this. This is the part where it's a little bit of a head scratcher. The so-called filter teams or taint teams that you hear about. They don't sound very nice, but they're made up of okay. third party neutral members who can review these documents the same way a special master but would. It, Donald Trump, though, of course, has no trust for that. And that's why you and I are talking now. So to summarize this, Joe, for those that are benumbed by the weekend and getting the kids back to school, this will yeah. be a legal process. It's not about one judge making a final decision. That's correct. Absolutely. And we should also note that the review that the, the director of national intelligence review of these documents to see if there are any, in fact, national security issues brought about by their living in a box at Mar-a-Lago for months and months will continue. The case against Donald Trump, however, will be on ice while this special master is uh, figured out. Also, if you can't just pick somebody and give them that job, the teams from the DOJ that got their hands on those documents uh, at Mar-a-Lago had to receive additional security clearances so they would just be allowed to read what they had found. Whomever is brought forth to be special master will also likely need that same level of clearance. There's a bigger question here, Joe, and it stems from that Thursday speech with President uh, Biden really calling out MAGA extremism, which is this reignites the Joe Biden versus Donald Trump or Donald Trump versus anyone debate heading yeah. into the midterm elections. Is this working for the Democrats? It's supposed to be advantage Democrats. Look, if you ask Joe Biden, if you ask the Democratic National Committee, if we could give you anything this midterm election season, what would it be? They'd want to run against Donald Trump, even though he's not on the ballot. But here we are. He may as well be on the ballot. And look at the rally that Trump held in Pennsylvania over the weekend. He is really helping to drive a lot of the discourse on the trail. The question is, how do voters clear through the muck? You've got inflation that's supposedly driving people to vote. You've got the aftermath of Roe v. Wade, which is very difficult to quantify and will likely uh, increase Democratic turnout. And then yeah. you've got the whole Trump-Biden ultra-MAGA thing, and it's difficult to see how that weighs in as well. Uh, so we're in a bit of a confused time here as the general election really begins now post-Labor Day. Joe, just quickly, before we let you go, uh, there is a question about the support for backing Ukraine, but more importantly, backing some of the sanctions in Russia right now. How much yeah. support is there domestically to help Europe to continue uh, waging some sort of counteroffensive versus Russia, given what's going on in Ukraine? 
That support remains intact. I just wonder where we are in the winter. There are concerns about war fatigue. There are concerns about heating bills going up. Obviously, that's going to be a major factor for Europe. But how about in New England, where people are preparing to, to fill the tanks with heating oil this winter, and they say, how long have we been doing this again? How many billions have we spent on weapons? This is going to be a messaging challenge for the White House to keep American voters on board while they try to keep the alliance abroad together. Joe Matthew, thank you, sir. Looking forward to the show a little bit later. Sound on on Bloomberg Radio weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And just to build on that, Lisa, and they are on top of the European story too, how do you keep European allies on side and the European electorate within some of these countries on side with this, with the pain that's starting to build? Well, you're not in a number of places, in particular in Italy. There was a poll that both of us were looking at over the weekend from Italy showing that 51 percent of those polled did not support the sanctions on Russia at this point because of where heating prices were going. At what point does this become something more mainstream and really start pushing back against some of the approaches? And this isn't necessarily the majority yet, but it has to be on the margins what a lot of politicians are dealing with. Energy bills in Italy, Tom. They're facing a 91% jump in power prices from a year ago. <clears throat> the team at Bloomberg News did a wonderful job of breaking this down country by country over the weekend. German electricity jumped 185% in August from a year earlier. They're the numbers, TK. It, they are it, big, big figures. As Greg Villiers says this morning, John, and it's of course hugely true for Europe all, it's a war. And I think one of the quiet stories off the American radar this weekend is the war grinds and continues. It's the and sanctions in response to that war, Tom, that have driven these big, big issues in the energy yeah. market. And to Lisa's point, can you keep the electorate, the whole of the electorate, on side I, as things get harder through the winter? Folkert's Landau, February 24th of Deutsche Bank. There's going to be a massive fiscal impulse. What's it going to be? Energy costs, rebuilding, et cetera. The fact is there's going to be a major fiscal impulse across Europe. And the question we're asking this week, Bramo, is whether this bond market is wide open for that kind of large-scale fiscal relief we're discussing. Who pays for it? At a certain point, we're looking at a huge fiscal response it, at a time when printed. funding is not free. What were you saying, Tom? It gets paid for and a leakage is foreign exchange and inflation. Weaker currency, some high yields. Yep. And we're seeing that in the UK. We're seeing that in Europe, too. Bruce Casman and JP Morgan is going to weigh in on some of this stuff. We'll join him a little bit later in this program. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Third week of losses on the S&P 500 last week from New York City this morning. Good morning. We're bouncing back a little bit, up nine-tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up around about one full percentage point. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley out in the last 24 hours, cutting his earnings estimates, and now saying that the minimum downside for this market, and he said this a few times, could well be 3,400 on the S&P, and we could see that in 4Q. That's the equity story. Here's the bond market picture for you. Twos, tens and thirties. On Friday, a lot of people called this a Goldilocks jobs report. Participation improving. Unemployment a little bit higher. Wages a little bit softer. Still robust payrolls growth. So we took out some of the work at the front end. Yields lower. We built it back in this morning. Up six basis points. The overwhelming takeaway at the end of the day is that this Fed has more work to do. 344.72 on a two-year right now. In the bond market over in the UK, yields have been absolutely surging. Unwinding some of the moves this morning at the front end and sterling bouncing back, but I just wanted to frame things over the last month for you, the last 30 days or so. Sterling is still weaker by about 4%. Cable's at 115.87 right now, but yesterday morning, 114.44. Yeah. The likes of City talking up maybe 105, 110 on cable. It all hinges, depends on what happens with the Fiscal Relief Act from the incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss, how big it's going to be. The numbers we're talking about right now, £170 oh. billion pounds worth of relief to help energy, businesses, to have the energy side for businesses and to provide right, relief John, to consumers too, Tom. That's about 5%. A GDP, that's a big, big package. Absolutely dead on, but I really want to emphasize, and there's a wonderful essay in the FT today driving this, people looking at the larger, broader, real income effects. I'm not going to give a, a, a course here, but the answer is they blow sterling through parity, which is unimaginable at this point. How do you finance it? And you and Lisa were talking about <clears> that, Tom. You said a weaker currency. Lisa's talking about high yields, and we've seen both. Right. We've seen both over the last month. Yields at the front end over the last month up by more than 100 basis points. And a team at Bloomberg just breaking the numbers down. The biggest monthly move we've just had through <clears> August <throat> at the front end, yields higher on record. Right. 3.15 right now on a two-year, Tom. I believe the Bank of England meeting about a week or so away. 
And we're focused on the ECB here. When is it, John? Thursday's ECB? It is Thursday, September Absolutely 8th. stunning. That will not be a snooze fest, uh, to say the least. We're going to pause right now. We do so with Bruce Kasman, Chief Economist, Head of Global Economic Research for J.P. Morgan, with so many things to talk about and to frame where we are now through the litmus paper of the system, which is foreign exchange. And, Bruce, we hearken back here to all the work over more than half a century of Mundell on to Jacob Frankel, who, of course, was working for J.P. Morgan for years, and then on to Ken Rogoff. And then I'd throw Bruce, Bruce Kasman in there as well. So we're going to talk to you this morning about what foreign exchange signals here. What does foreign exchange signal, and is it the ultimate release valve for these fiscal and monetary stresses? Well, I think the the simple thing that foreign exchange is uh, is signaling right now is that the U.S. economy is faring better than the rest of the world, and the Fed has more work to do. So we're seeing the dollar moving up. Uh, I think what's interesting about the the dynamic and, and and what's reflected in FX is we've moved from a world where in the last two three months we've been worried about a U.S. led global recession to now one where <laughs> The combination of European problems right. with energy and China weakening is now the more significant uh, problem. Dr. Kasman, I know you were like me in the basement with your Gilbert chem set long ago. There was logwood and all those other little chemistry things we made. Your Gilbert chem set right now is Japan. They are failing in a theory that keeps getting tested and tested by the market. When does their theory of limiting through bond illiquidity the rate rise, when does that end? Well, I think the, the story in Japan is interesting because the, the continued purchases of assets is probably uh, counterproductive at this point and unsustainable. Yeah. But the dynamic of the Bank of Japan letting uh, the inflation story run through, trying to establish a more sustainable rise in inflation makes sense. I think the the problem in Japan is they're getting stuck in this mode of saying that they continue to need to buy assets, keep interest rates uh, pegged uh, close to zero uh, in a world in which uh, the dynamics are really requiring something different. I, I would like to see them move away from YCC uh, targets as tight as they are, but keep policy rates unchanged to continue to keep the uh, inflationary dynamic moving through the system there in a way that they certainly need. Well, Bruce, Japan's an island of its own, both physically as yeah. well as for monetary policy. The rest of the world is hiking rates into weakness, and we are seeing that with the Federal Reserve to a lesser degree, but to a bigger degree, the ECB, which is expected to raise rates by 75 basis points on Thursday. How much are we looking at both the fiscal and the monetary impulse working against each other and creating a whole lot of pain that we're not pricing in? Well, it's an interesting question. I think the ECB needs to get policy rates towards neutral in a world in which they certainly have recession risk, but they also have fairly significant inflation concerns. Keeping policy rates at zero don't make sense. We think they're going to move 75 basis points. You know, as you're noting, the fiscal policy in Europe, uh, and by the way, Europe and China are both moving in the other direction, supporting growth. Uh, I think this is the right thing to do against the backdrop of what is a huge hit to household and in some cases business incomes. Um, but the consequences of that are, we believe that the ECB is going to move policy rates up to something like one and a half percent, even as the European economy suffers as we go through this winter. One and a half percent by the end of this year, you're saying, Bruce? That's correct, yeah. So let's talk about what kind of downturn we're expecting from that, if there is the fiscal support that's helping to support the economy. But there needs to be, according to certain economic theory, some sort of deceleration activity in order to bring inflation under control. What kind of deceleration is required, both European-wise as well as in the U.S., to bring inflation back to something more like the target for central banks? I think that's the rub here, which is to say that if we avoid the very damaging uh, recession dynamic in which labor markets weaken a lot, the combination of tight labor markets, salience, which is changing wage and price setting process, and some things that are happening in the global economy that are not going to return to normal, suggests to us that you're going to get inflation down quite a bit here, but you're not going to get it down enough. So uh, I don't think a move up back to 7% unemployment in the euro area, which is our forecast with a, a mild recession, I don't think a move up to 4% inflation, uh, unemployment rates, excuse me, in the U.S. are going to be enough to do the job. And I think central banks are starting to uh, understand that. They're not there yet. But over time, I think part of the problem we have 
is we're going to need much well, more significant adjustments in labor markets to contain inflation. Then with that said, Brad, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Kavzin, with that said, very, very import, important here, where is it? where does it become more difficult for central bankers? One of my problems is everybody's stressed out about the now, and I'm like, wait a minute, the now is not the point. Where out there is where the stress really comes in for monetary decision? Is it this year, next year? Well, I think it comes when policy stances are restrictive and labor markets are turning soft. And that's, you know, I think one of the interesting things in the U.S. right now, last Friday's report doesn't suggest to us that the labor market is soft at this point. So the Fed doesn't have a, a really difficult choice continuing to move. But once you get policy into uh, a restrictive stance, which the ECB is far away from, but the Fed is starting to move towards, and you start to see the effects of tight monetary policy and other things weaken labor markets, that's when the choices become more difficult. We're not there yet uh, e for the uh, Fed in terms of the labor market. We're not there yet for the ECB in terms of policy stance. Uh, I think we get there sometime early next year, and that's when I think you're going to have more interesting choices to be made, more difficult choices to be made. We do think the Fed is going to stop somewhere close to four, and we think the ECB is going to stop somewhere close to one and a half to take stock of what they've done against softening economies. So, Bruce, let's put some numbers on this. What kind of unemployment rate are you expecting that is required to bring inflation under control in the European region as well as in the United States? Well, let's just be careful here. I think a move from what has been something like 9% inflation over the last year down to four or five, that's going to happen with energy markets uh, normalizing. Uh, with the slowing we've seen in global growth taking goods pressures off. I think you get that pretty much uh, without having to do anything. The question is getting back down to two. Uh, and I think in that context, I would argue that you need to probably push the U.S. unemployment rate uh, up above 5% and probably push the euro area unemployment rate up towards 8% at, at minimums. And that's not going to happen without uh, something that we would naturally call a retrenchment, a recession of more magnitude than uh, what we're forecasting and most others are. Short and shallow doesn't fit in there, does it, Bruce? When they sort of add short, short, short and shallow recessions. It doesn't. First of all, that's hard to achieve. Let's just to, to, to gradually move the U.S. unemployment rate up to 4 percent is something which would be hard to do, uh, not, not by any means impossible. But yeah, I think to get the inflation picture back in the bottle, uh, with a 4% unemployment rate, a very mild uh, subpar growth phase. That's not what history suggests can really do the job. Recognizing getting down from nine is easy. You know, getting from nine to four or five, I think that's a done deal, just, just given where energy prices are, given what's happening in global manufacturing. Bruce Kasman, thank you, Bruce. Really thoughtful stuff from JP Morgan. Lisa, the other additional thought I think that I've got, and others have too, is whether this is more than a one-year thing, yeah. more than one winter, particularly in Europe, and that's been floated by politicians in Europe now. I think lately the Shell CEO, the Shell CEO Ben Van Burden, talked about the prospect of that as well. What if this is five winters, maybe longer, and that's a big, big problem? If they have to completely rejigger their energy grid, that is going to be a huge challenge, especially with a lot of disagreement over how to do that, right? I mean, there's this question about nuclear power and Germany possibly delaying the roll-off of some of those plants. There's a question about coal, right? It had been left for dead as dirty energy. Now coal prices are surging to the highest on record in Europe because people are bringing it back. How do you rejigger a grid in an era where you're still trying to be aware of environmental concerns? Another reason why so many people are bearish, Tom, and I go back to that Ben Laidler conversation we started the hour <clears throat> with just about 40 minutes ago, Tom. Can you be bullish right now? And he said, I think you've answered your own question. Everyone's yeah, bearish, of, so maybe you can be. Yeah, there's a lot of gloom out there. Another bull John uh, Stolfus just publishes, and he talks about the worry. John, the projections that are out the negative projections. Bramo is negative projections this morning. <laughs> negative projections, just this yeah, morning. Negative projections. Just this morning. <laughs> it's a constant state. Negative projection, John, is where you go, get out of bed. You have to go to school. Futures get up 8 out cents of 1% bed. from New York City. Is that what you're doing this morning? Get out <laughs> of bed now. 
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. The U.S. Justice Department is deciding what to do next in the case of those documents taken from Donald Trump's home. A federal judge has granted the former president's request that a special master, a neutral third party, be appointed to review the documents. The judge also temporarily blocked the U.S. from using the documents in its criminal investigation. The Justice Department hasn't said whether it will appeal. The Prime Minister of Ukraine is confident that European leaders will keep sanctions on Russia despite the turmoil they face in the energy markets. He spoke with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. We can see absolute understanding from European leaders that uh, we are in a hybrid war. We have absolute understanding that uh, Russia is uh, blackmailing European uh, politicians and we have absolutely assurement from uh, European politics that they will stay with Ukraine till the win. The Prime Minister also said Ukraine's allies should do what they can to help the war end the war quickly, since Moscow is willing to keep fighting for a long period. And in the UK, incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss has drafted plans to freeze energy bills for British households at or below the current level. According to documents seen by Bloomberg, the freeze could cost as much as $150 billion over the next 18 months. Truss is also planning a $46 billion support package to lower energy bills for businesses. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The best case for consumers at the moment is really sad to say is uh, is pulling back on consumption, conserving. They're doing it because high prices tend to do that. But uh, there is no way that there can be a replacement of the lost Russian gas in Europe uh, without there being phenomenal drop in demand. That's the big, big problem, the unique problem the Europeans have right now. That was Ed Moss of Citigroup from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures bouncing back three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, bouncing back eight tenths of 1% after three weeks of losses. Yields up a little bit as well, TK, up four basis points. Your 10-year, 322.92. Right now we're going to look at commodities. I'm walking through those prices. John's talking about the political tensions in Europe and I guess there's a little bit of a rollover, but it's really nothing to write home about. The tensions exist in hydrocarbons. They also exist around the world. And what's important into September is what has not happened, which is food inflation has actually subsided worldwide. She is expert on food inflation. We'll talk to her, of course, about the hydrocarbon story as well. Kona Hake, head of research at EDNF. Man, Kona, honored to have you on and particularly about what has not happened which is food inflation, wheat, corn, rice did not take off worldwide. Is there still a risk that we could see food inflation in those emerging market core commodities? So the peak was in May, in March, straight after the Ukraine invasion. And I think as with all food commodities, high price is always the cure for high prices. Literally, we saw a ramp up of exports from all origins, and that did provide some short-term supply relief. Now, we did fall too soon, too sharp, straight after um, the harvest started to come along. But August was some, we did see some supply risks. I mean, I think the huge and unprecedented droughts we saw in the US Midwest, in Europe, these 500-year-old droughts, I mean, that definitely caused some damage. And we did see some spike in some of the grains in August. Um, but now, I think what you're seeing is probably the risk period is probably behind us now. Mm -hmm. So I feel like food inflation is now some, it's abating a little bit. But by the time it gets to emerging markets, I think when, when you look at the supply chain issues, freight, and you know the, the rate at which the middle men pass that cost on, I think you will see a slower in food inflation, but not not terrible right now. It's not looking yeah. as bad as it was five months ago. Dovetail your Brent call whatever your Brent call is, into where it really matters for the rest of your commodity analysis, food inflation. Those two points, is, is it 120 a barrel? Are we there right now? Where does Brent become germane for food inflation? 
the food inflation link with crude oil, energy, gas, you name it, it's huge. Um, right now, fertilizer costs, which are so important to provide the next crops um, sustainability, is hugely reliant on gas prices. So we're seeing today um, fertilizer plants being shut down because they can't afford the gas prices. So that's going to have an impact on next year's crop for sure. Um, but shorter term, yes, energy drives the tractors, you know, the fuel cost, the cost of um, bringing the Brazilian corn crop all the way to the port. This requires diesel. So energy at $90 per barrel is still very, very significant. And I think it is therefore, it's not likely that food prices are going to go all the way to the bottom like it was maybe three years ago. We're going to we're going to we're definitely plateaued. We're coming off, but we're not going to go rocketing down because we have underlying cost pressures that are going to keep prices slightly higher. So, Kona, this really highlights how important the energy story is to everything, right? And underpinning this sort of inflationary tilt across the board. There was a report out from Goldman Sachs this morning, or over the weekend, I should say, saying that energy bills for European households may surge by two trillion euros at their peak to account for about 15 percent of Europe's GDP. At what point are we looking at something that is one winter versus two versus three that feels a lot longer because of the difficulties in readjusting the grid? Oh, my God, it's a nightmare. Um, I do think, obviously, governments will do what they can to make sure it's stuck to one winter. So this one is going to be the most severe. The, they're on track to build their storage levels. So Germany, at least, is there. But I think the Nord Stream outage is going to pose some risks there. The fact of the matter is they can't afford another winter like this. It's simply impossible to um, politically be allow allowing that to happen. So they're going to have to invest in supply, alternative supplies, whether it's renewable, whether it's nuclear. I know nothing of that is immediate and nothing's going to be fast. It's going to have to be a combination of demand destruction. But demand destruction is also politically un unpalatable because it essentially means you need to create a recession. So it's not going to be easy, but I can't see next year being as intense as this year will be. So, Kona, where is the peripheral supply coming from? You talked about nuclear. There's so much pushback to that, even just keeping some of the nuclear plants open uh, in Germany. You talk about coal. Well, that does really flies in the face of a lot of ESG requirements. Mm -hmm. Where is it coming from? How active have European leaders been in sourcing some of these energy? Well, they haven't been. They've been sleeping. And I think this, is the, this has been a massive wake-up call for them. So, you know, look at our new prime minister in the UK, Liz Trust. All the ESG concerns seem to be going out the win window. She's she's going for, um, yeah, she's, she's kind of going for nuclear, but she's also going for all the fossil fuels are all back up and running. So support is there, but in tandem with renewables, to be fair. But they want everything now and nothing's going to happen now. And not when government budgets are so stretched. I mean, I just don't know where it's going to come from. And if you're going to windfall tax these um, the energy sector, I think that's, that's going to further deter supply side investment. So it's it's incredibly challenging. Kind of hack of ADNF man. Kind of one of the best. Just great to catch up with you as always. Kind of thank, thank you. you. Lisa, this is the number one question I think for this program for the next number of months now. We're about to put together a massive fiscal effort in Europe and we're all asking the same question. Is the bond market wide open to finance it? And what happens if it's not? And what happens if you start to get yields surging after era uh, decades of yields being so low, companies financing themselves in that type of environment as well as governments? And what do you do at a time when central banks have to raise rates to punitive degrees in yep. order to keep inflation under control? It's mind spinning. This is a new era and it is one of the most pressing concerns facing us over the next few months, if not years. I've said this a few times, but in the pandemic, Tom, we had low inflation, we were cutting rates, we had QE. Now we have high inflation, oh. we're raising rates, and we have QT. It's a very different backdrop for this bond market to stomach the kind of fiscal relief right. these governments are trying to provide. What I would suggest, John, it was a medical war. It was an intangible against a pandemic, a huge impact. This is an actual war with tangible commodity changes, which you see in every war, quite frankly. I would suggest that the fiscal expansion, which one number I saw was 8% of GDP in the United Kingdom, which is stunning. Stunning statistic. John, it's always the same story. It gets fixed. The issuance of paper, of gilts or whatever, pick the country, and then you see it in inflation, 
and you always see it in foreign exchange. The currency weaker, yields higher. Yep. It's been the story of the last month just, for the Europeans, for the Brits as well. Futures right now up 27 on the S&P, up 7 tenths of 1%. If you're just tuning in after the long weekend, we bounce back on the Nasdaq, up 3 quarters of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. Three weeks of losses, though. Can we put together a week of gains? Going into an ECB meeting this Thursday, looking for potentially something like a 75 basis point hike, a 50 basis point hike. Chairman Powell actually speaking on the same morning. Yeah. So we'll hear from him on Thursday. What's that about, Bramo? I have no Scheduling idea. Scheduling Chairman yeah. Powell with an ECB anyway from New York City. Let's see if that changes. This is Bloomberg. Unfortunately, good news in the labor market can be bad news because the Fed will have to respond more. This isn't really going to significantly change the trajectory of the Fed. We've heard from the Fed that we are likely to be higher and tighter for longer. That was the core messaging from Jackson Hole. There will not be rate cuts in 2023. I think the Fed's telling us there's going to be pain. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures bouncing back up seven tenths of 1% on the S&P. TK and the NASDAQ up three quarters of 1%. Equity lift in the United States, VIX to 25.58 gets my attention as well. But John, this is a global Tuesday and the global Tuesday is currencies in revolt. They're the litmus paper of the system and they're screaming monetary and particularly fiscal stress. The fiscal relief is the big, big topic of discussion over in Europe, Tom. 130 billion potentially from Liz Truss, the incoming prime minister for consumers, then 40 billion potentially to help small businesses. Tom, that's 170 billion sterling. That's a lot of money in the UK. One of the ratios, yeah. One Question of the, ratios, of the morning, yeah. can this bond market finance it? The, but the answer is yes, they can always finance it. In every single war, without question, it gets financed. It's, it's what happens after that. And that's a question, John, of United Kingdom productivity, obviously under the new gaze of Brexit here. If they have to go out on a 10-year plan, what is the productivity of the nation on a goods producing and particularly service sector side? Lisa, at what price? How high does that yield need to go? How much weaker does that currency need to get? And how unsustainable is that potential price or that potential rate for a market, for a global economy that has taken on so much debt? And this is the difference. This is the distinction between now and previous bouts where there needed to be some borrowing to pay for a war, to pay for a pandemic. We are looking at economies that have already tacked on so much debt that it becomes perhaps a different bill in a different order of magnitude than perhaps we've seen in the past. Quote of the morning comes from Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley to kick off your trading week with a bearish tilt. You might hear from Mark Klanovich of JP Morgan a little bit later. I'll bring you that quote if we do. Mike Wilson says this on his earnings forecast cuts. We think the next several quarters <coughs> will end up containing some of the most significant downward revisions to forward EPS forecasts we have seen in the past several cycles. That is a big, big call, Lisa, from Mike Wilson, looking for downside, minimum downside of this equity market, 3,400 on the S&P, which he thinks is going to come in 4Q. Yeah, and what we're looking at is someone who has been bearish consistently, and some people might say, well, he's an uber bear, and yet he's getting more bearish as time goes on, not less, even as the rest of the world kind of hues to his predictions at a time when there has been a worst case that has been borne out in several fronts. We haven't even talked about China and the escalating lockdowns there, just continuing this feeling of global recession. Worst case at the start of the year has become the base case in the middle of the year. The question we're all trying to ask, Tom, is how much worse can it get? And is it time to lean the other way? Is it time to lean in the other direction? Well, yeah, John, and I'm doing the math here while your guys are going on with the doom and the gloom, and it's real simple. Mike Wilson is modeling SPX down 14%. I mean, John, that's that's the kind of big, bold move that is, and that is the mood that's out there right now. And that number could be even lower, Tom, if we get some kind of deep recession. I'll go through the numbers from Mike a little bit later. Futures right now up three quarters of 1% on the NASDAQ 100, on the S&P 500, <clears throat> up seven tenths of 1%. Yields higher by four or five basis points on a 10-year, 323.30 on a 10-year. Crude a little bit lower, down a half of 1%, 86.42. 
The FX market all over the place. This Tuesday, I have to say, a bit of calm for euro dollar. Unchanged, Bramo, 99.32. Yeah, but the dollar index, DXY, definitely creeping up as there is this feeling that the dollar continues to be the haven as the rest of the world reels in a series of crises. Over in Europe, it's very much an energy crisis. And with the UK, Liz Truss is going to be delivering a speech today. We're expecting probably around 11.30 at Eastern time from 10 Downing Street. Perhaps we'll get some more details on this plan that she has to support households as you do see energy bills poised to climb significantly. How do you freeze them where they are? How does this translate into the British pound versus the dollar? And John, we've been talking about this, and I know that, Tom, you were pointing this out. Calls now for parity, not of the euro, but of the pound with the dollar, as there does have to be this relief mechanism in order to really finance the increase of budget deficit to deal with this crisis. Today, the U.S. Senate is returning after Labor Day, although talking with Joe Matthew, it sounds like perhaps they haven't really returned yet, considering the quiet after the Labor Day holiday in the United States. We are still looking at oil prices, at gasoline prices going down. And I will just know we are seeing crude prices go down, too, even after OPEC+. Plus. Uh, it said that they were going to cut supply. This is a real question about demand, right? If you're cutting supply and you still see prices go down, how much is this a statement about a deceleration in economic activity that you're seeing around the world? And how much does this really support or feed into the Mike Wilson call of lower uh, margins, lower earnings ahead? And at 10 a.m., we get some sense of the U.S. services sector with the ISM index for the month of August getting released. There is an expectation it could fall to lows not seen since the heart of the pandemic. At what point, John, do we need services to get back in order to get the economy? Economy in the United States with enough momentum to move away from the gloom and doom in the rest of the world. Elisa, if the Senate's back, does AMH come back? <laughs> I think that she is coming She's back. She's actually going to return. Yes, I think that we're going to hear from Was her there tomorrow. a signing? She's been gone about a month, Tom. I haven't well, seen her for a long, know, long time. Between Lisa and AMH, I don't I mean, begrudge vacation. Wow. I've got 142 days left for the end of the year. Work it out, TK. I am. This show's gone European. I'm taking off November. In more ways than one. <laughs> Troy Gaski joins us now, Chief Market Strategist at FS Investments. Troy, you ask yourself your own questions in your notes, I notice, so I'll read some of them out. Did you take advantage of the recent nonsensical bear market rally to lighten up on equity risk? Did you use the recent decline in bond yields to lighten up on duration? Troy, did you? Yeah, so basically, depending on the strategy, you know, we layered in some more defensive uh, <clears throat> calls that we sold. In other cases, more importantly, we sized up our basis short, uh, which is short pass-throughs and long treasuries because that effectively had round tripped. It came in the year at extreme tights. We knew the Fed was gonna be winding down their balance sheet. Uh, spreads gapped wide with the first six months of the year and, and we were able to reload that trade into weakness. So that's worked out fairly well, well for us the last several weeks. Troy, as a gentleman from MIT, it's good to see you with the engineering physics of inertia. What is the inertia, right? You say you're fighting inertia. What is the inertia now that you're fighting in the equity markets? Well, I think more broadly, the reason we use the term inertia is, is we've been a little shocked at how much inertia there's been this year for asset allocation. I mean, it was fairly obvious coming into the year that the Fed would tighten. Now, like Lisa was saying before, obviously things have gotten even worse than we thought with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, China's COVID zero policies, and much higher inflation that's forcing the Fed to tighten. But the concept of inertia is things have been so good for so long, Tom, as people have been bailed out time after time by central bank balance sheet expansion, uh, that there's been very little movement to get more defensive this year in client portfolios, despite what was obviously going to be a more challenging environment for 60-40 than we've had over the past 12 to 13, and moreover, the past 20 to 40 years, depending on your time horizon. So, Troy, when will you know that the bottom has been reached? When will you know that the pessimism has been really priced in and that we have moved away from the inertial uh, momentum that we have seen over the past few months? Well, so uh, one of the differences between this downturn and most of the downturns we've had the last 13 years since quantitative easing came about is it's going to be much harder to identify a viable bottom, right? During the pandemic, for instance, obviously, once the Fed flooded the zone with liquidity and fiscal stimulus showed up, you were fairly certain that the bottom was in and you could buy aggressively. If you go back to 15, 16, you know, once Yellen decided to only hike once, um, and then, of course, in the GFC, there are multiple tests. So it's going to be much harder to identify a viable bottom. That being said, at some point when you get the S&P in that 13 to 15 times forward earnings and there's light at the end of the tunnel for inflation uh, re 
uh, achieving a 2 to 3%, which probably won't be till the end of 23 at the soonest. That's the time you probably want to start nibbling back. Until then, you want to be in the northwest quadrant of the efficient frontier. You want to protect capital, grind out a mid-single digit to low, high single digit return in order to protect capital and eke out something that's much more modest compared to what all of us have enjoyed from the bear market bottom at the end of the GFC. And Troy, if you had to take a bet right now on who cuts rates first, is it the Fed or the ECB? ECB. Yeah, it, it's just unfortunately the weakness in their economy is already very clear and present. Um, in the U.S., we used to have much more labor market shock and obviously aren't getting hit nearly as hard on the energy costs, particularly natural gas. So, you know, the ECB obviously in the near term is going to tighten, but it's highly, highly unlikely that the, the Eurozone can avoid a recession in the near term. In the U.S., you know, recession risk is certainly elevated compared to three to six months ago, but that's over more of a six to 12 month time horizon because the labor market, as you know, still stays remarkably resilient in the face of global weakness. Troy, this is what Wei Li of BlackRock told our colleagues here at Bloomberg on Europe. Compared to expectations at the beginning of the year, this is pretty close to the worst outcome. Most people on board with that, Troy. From your perspective, and you answered this looking at the United States, try and answer this looking at Europe. When do you start to lean the other way against some of this gloom around Europe? Because I'm not sure how much it gets much worse than this right now. Yeah, you, you know, it's a great question, John. I think it's very dangerous to step in front of trends that are this powerful, right? When you think of all the, the various drivers of this, whether it's interest rate differentials, growth differentials, just trend following technical behavior, the massive energy shock, you know, meter version systems can start nibbling, and I would recommend going through quantitative systems that are very disciplined. But in the meanwhile, there are so many other things to do, whether it's senior secured commercial real estate debt or low beta multi-strategy funds. You know, stepping in front of a freight train can be a very painful exercise as a discretionary manager. You know, the old adage is the trend <laughs> is your friend, right? And you might not want to try to fight it too hard at this stage of a market cycle. This is a bearish freight train in a big, big way. And I've asked a few times over the last couple of months how much worse it could get for Europe, and it keeps getting worse. Troy, thank you. Troy Gansky of FS Investments. Where we are now compared to where we were at the start of the year, greatest example of that for me is the Federal Reserve. At the December meeting when they put out the forecast for this year for Fed funds year-end, 90 basis points. That was year-end on Fed funds. That was the central forecast. In the last projection from June, that was 340. And we'll see what that is when we get the September projections in a couple of weeks' time. But, Lisa, it gives you an idea of how much has changed between the start of the year and where we are currently. The end of the year, the projection is for a close to a 4% rate, interest rate in the United States. From 90 basis points. Yes, there you go. The December forecast to maybe a four-handle on Fed funds. Futures up three quarters of 1% from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all after a long weekend stateside. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Liz Truss officially becomes the UK's next Prime Minister today after winning the Conservative Party's leadership contest. And she's drafting plans to aid households and businesses with their soaring energy bills. The proposals could cost close to $200 billion. The Justice Department is considering whether to appeal a judge's decision regarding documents seized from Donald Trump's home in Florida. The judge has granted the former president's request to have a special master, a neutral third party, review the papers. The judge, who was appointed during the Trump administration, also temporarily blocked the government from using the documents in its criminal investigation. Russia may face a longer and deeper recession as the impact of U.S. and European sanctions spreads. Bloomberg has viewed an internal report prepared for the Russian government. Two of the three scenarios in the report show a contraction accelerating next year. They see the economy returning to the pre-war level only at the end of the decade or later. And California has narrowly avoided having to impose rotating power blackouts due to a heat wave. Still, officials warn that the state's power grid faces an even bigger test today. Power demand could reach an all-time high as businesses and schools reopen after the long Labor Day weekend. The drugstore chain CVS keeps expanding beyond its retail origins. The company has reached a deal to buy home health and technology services provider Signify Health for about $8 billion in cash. Other bidders included Amazon and United Health. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We have and will 
continue to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis. And I know that Liz Truss and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis. We can all agree on the word choice there, crisis. It is one. That was the outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the UK, the incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss. We'll hear from her, no doubt, a little bit later. From New York City this morning, good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovic. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up seven tenths of one percent. We bounce back on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up seven tenths of one percent also. Yields are higher by five or six basis points now, getting closer to 325 on a 10-year, 324.43. And in the FX market, for once, a bit of calm on euro dollar, basically unchanged, Tom, 99.34. Right. John, what do prime ministers do in the United Kingdom when they retire, are out, etc.? Like, what did Churchill do? Well, they can carry on being members of parliament. I believe Theresa May is still in parliament right now, Yeah, Tom. OK. So, so you, they, they you go take, back to take Congress. Your choice. We don't do that, but, but they go back to Congress. Well, that's because you're an MP, Tom, and then yeah. you become the leader of the party and you become okay. the but prime I minister think it's if pretty your party's cool. in control. They like sure. go back to Congress. Yeah. Uh, although not quite. Are we going to go over that whole system versus system thing? No, I just think it's again. very cool that like he could yes, go back and be a is, yes. House of Representatives or Senator or whatever. Because he's still an MP, Tom. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I think, <laughs> you know. I'm not doing this John, are we get are we getting rid of VAR in the Premier League? I, I think would you, we Would you like to, it going to make some would, mistakes over the weekend, Tom? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, They've got to fix this. I agree. Okay, thank you. We agree on something. We can move forward now with Joe Matthew in Washington. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew, of course, with a sterling radio program. Joe, a missile just launched by Agnanovich Hood and Wilkins describing the folly known as the budget process in modern Washington. It used to be there was an appropriations committee for fiscal year 2023. They have like 12 or 21 bills, whatever. Yep. They've passed exactly zero. Our budget system is broken, isn't it? So what happens this week? Uh, more kicking of the can, I guess. You're right. This is you're supposed to have the 12 appropriations bills. I can hear our friend Rick Davis somewhere screaming regular order as we have this conversation. This is the kind of stuff that really irks lawmakers who've been around for a minute. There are lawmakers on Capitol Hill, though, who've been in town for a couple of years that have never seen an actual budget in the traditional sense, at least. Lawmakers are coming back now, Tom, and I think this is where you're going. They need to craft a spending plan. The government runs out of money at the end of September. They will likely kick the can with a so-called continuing resolution, bring us to mid-December. The question is, what are they attached to that bill? And that's a big part of the conversation this morning in Washington. I, I look, Joe, at, at the process here, and it seems to be just horse trading. Is that all this is at the end of the day? Is the leaders doing the legislation and not chairman or committees? I think that's exactly right. That's yeah. a pretty good description. I might steal I that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, indeed, you passed the test, in the wonk test in Washington. The question is, though, how about some of the other pieces of legislation, you know, that we're talking about here uh, with regard particularly to same-sex marriage? That could be attached to a spending bill. That's going to irk some lawmakers and could lead to a much more concerted debate uh, that's going on here in Washington. The House will be back next week, and that's when it gets real. Joe, where is the ESG agenda for this administration and their budget, especially considering the energy independence desire for this nation, the fact that coal is going gangbusters in Europe yeah. and uh, oil prices have been climbing, um, have come off a little bit, but still very much in the forefront? This is a really complicated scenario for this White House, Lisa, and I'm not sure exactly how to answer it because prices are driving everything. And as, as you well know, if you look at Joe Biden's approval ratings, they are uh, tracking the price of gas very closely, an inverse relationship, almost like nothing else matters right now. So while the White House is celebrating 80 days or whatever it is of lower gas prices, you know, they start talking about the ESG program, climate change in the most recent bill that was passed, the infrastructure, I should say, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Some of them start to sound the same after a while. The question is, how do we get through winter? Yes, we're going to have, obviously, a climate agenda here at the White House, but it's blunted by reality. Just like the Europeans are worried about winter, we are as well. And by the way, we're worried about the rest of the summer. This is going to be the, the, the biggest drain on the, on the electric grid in California history today. The heat wave that has engulfed the West 
has created a massive demand for energy, and it does run counter to what the White House is trying to do here. Even when Elon Musk talks about this, this is the man behind, of course, the, you know, the most successful electric car company. He says, we need more gas now, even as we continue to press forward with our climate change initiatives. You can't have one without the other. Joe, how much conviction is there? How much support is there in Washington to support Europe to increase some of the gas exports to the region? That's also going to be driven by, I think, the reality. It's kind of a game day call. I asked three members of the White House economic team over the course of last week about this. Specifically, do we have the spare capacity to help? And the answer is very vague. We'll do whatever we can, but of course we have our own needs here at home. The news from OPEC right now would challenge this as well just a little bit as the White House issues a statement saying that it's still going to do whatever it can to bring down the price of oil. Sharing with other nations may or may not be part of that. Joe Matthew, thank you. So much to discuss after the long weekend. Yeah. Joe down in D.C. on Sound on Bloomberg Radio weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Futures right now, Tom, on the S&P. Up, let's call it six tenths of one percent. Watching yen, number one thing I'm watching, John. Yen creeps away to new weakness. This is stunning. Back, I believe, to 1998, we're nearing a 142 on yen. That is just absolutely jaw-dropping. It's not job. working, is it, Tom? Now, typically, in a world like the one we're in right now, one of the big trades well, would be you take something with a high beta to global growth, you get long against, the, get long the yen against that currency, Tom, and that's not working out. I mean, take a look at the chart of Aussie yen. As a great example of, yep, of how I've it's not working it twice out. Today. I've looked at it twice today. It's buttressed up. It's strong Aussie weak yen. And, and you know, you never, John, my, one thing I would say, this is really important. You can think as hard as you want. And when you've got multi-currency systems, you never know which one's going to give way. Well, one thing we I've do know, huge humility about that. based on Jackson Hole, is that the ECB is willing to keep on hiking rates and tolerate a recession. Until the facts change. That the Federal Reserve is willing to keep on hiking rates and maybe tolerate the same. And Lisa, the BOJ has no interest in doing any of those things right now. Well, and they're doubling down on that. Tom, go ahead. No, I, I, I just think when the facts change, they'll amend those, those, those theories. You'd expect the yen to snap in the other way, Tom? I, I don't know what I expect other than I love this phrase from Bullard, Lisa, front loading. Well, there have been a number of theories that until the dollar weakens, it's going to be tough for the Bank of Japan to move away from some of their prognostications on their own terms, which is what they really want to do. Futures right now up 24, up 6 tenths of 1% on the S&P, and then that's that 100 up 7 tenths of 1%. Yield tires, 7 basis points, 325.57. Counting it down to an ECB rate decision this Thursday. And another address from Chairman Powell later this week as well. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. After three weeks of losses on the S&P 500, just a small bounce back relative to the losses we've seen. Up about six tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up a half of one percent. Talked a lot about Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, cutting his earnings forecast through 2023, looking for some significant revisions, and still says we have not seen the lows of this bear market. Says there's somewhere in and around 3,400 at a minimum, and we could see that in 4Q. That's the equity picture. Here's the bond market. Market story yields lower on Friday off the back of a payrolls report that a lot of people said had that Goldilocks feel to it. Participation up, unemployment higher, wages a little softer and still some robust payrolls growth. I can tell you we took out some work from the front end of the yield curve on Friday. We had it back in this morning of seven basis points on a two year 345.55. Over the last month we've done a lot of work in the gilt market. We just had in August the biggest monthly climb higher in two-year yields on record in the gilt market. The two-year over the last month up 120 basis points. The 10-year up 92. The currency a whole lot weaker cable. 115.85 right now, 114 handle. Yesterday, I think the lower the session was 114.44. And Lisa's been asking the important question all morning. Let's trust the incoming prime minister is talking up the prospect of 170 billion sterling of aid to offset the energy crisis. That's about 5% of GDP. How will we finance it? A weaker currency, higher yields, and how difficult is it going to be this time around to do the same kind of things that they did back in the pandemic? When back in the pandemic, we had low inflation, we were cutting rates, and we had QE. And now we have high inflation, we're hiking rates. And Tom, in many parts of the world, 
we have QT? Well, in many parts of the world is the key thing here, John. What really strikes me, coming off Labor Day, it's the beginning of the financial season as well, is how discreet and alone the United States is. All these other places, to borrow from Troy Gajewski, are going to use the war inertia or the Asia COVID Chengdu lockdown inertia, and they're going to buttress off that. And the U.S. is alone in its excellence. You know who's it's alone, Tom? Who's alone in the central banking world? The BOJ. The Bank of Japan is in a very lonely place. And that tells you why dollar yen TK went through 142 a couple of minutes ago. 142, and those publications, John, are just absolutely extraordinary. There's no other way to put it. We're rapidly to that 145 level. Is 150 unimaginable? I'm not so sure. After a 4% move in the month of August, we add to it this morning, 141.99 right now, 142 flat, a move of one percentage point in that currency pair. That's the cross-asset price action. Let's get you some single names. We can do that with Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Hey, John. It really is a macro morning. And let's just put that into focus, especially ahead of the ECB meeting on Thursday and the confab of energy ministers in the Euro region on Friday. But there are some idiosyncratic stories. Bed Bath & Beyond is always one. Uh, this time, plunging 14.4% ahead of the open as a result of the death of the CFO tragically dying. This uh, seems to be what's generating the move in the shares. Lower GameStop, another meme stock. Uh, declining, perhaps in sympathy. Uh, people sort of questioning whether the froth is coming off that particular sector down 3.8%. Tapestry, interesting. Those shares down 2.1%. So, Some people thinking that the retailer may struggle because of the uh, increased COVID lockdowns in China. It is going to make it very hard for certain aspects of the luxury market to really rejuvenate. Elsewhere, when you're taking a look at markets, again, it is a rather quiet morning. FedEx is catching my notice, though, because Citigroup downgraded it to neutral. Those shares down at 1.6 percent. The concern here is the macro concern, a decline in volumes of packages being sent around. How much do we see this really bleeding out, not just in some of the big retailers, but also the transport sectors as a result of trade, of econ economic activity contracting? And Co-Star Group and Invitation Homes both surging as a result of being added to the S&P, Tom. Those shares up 7.4 and 6.9 percent, respectively. It will be interesting uh, to see, and again, the VIX 25.70, Dow up, uh, it was about up 200 points earlier. It's a nice lift to the market uh, this morning. Right now, Michael Schumacher joins us, Global Head of Macro Strategy at Wells Fargo, with a very sharp note out this morning. Michael, I want to take that analogy from academics of butterflies flapping, which has to do with the research of little things happening out there, whether it's Philippine peso buttressed right up against uh, 57, Thai bot, and all the rest of it as well. Which butterflies are you watching this morning? Biggest butterfly we're watching, Tom, is I'd say it has to be the BOJ. It's got to be the yen. It's it's amazing. And you might say, well, it's not a butterfly. It's a giant. Okay, fine. But it's it's huge and it's, it's impacting markets in very unclear ways, I think, going forward. And the, the thought we've had that a lot of people have had is sooner or later, Corona-san will back away from his target on 10-year rates. But the question is when and how. A, a basic question, Mike, and I say this with great respect for our audience of listeners and viewers. Why should Americans care about a stunning first and second derivative of yen weakness? Yeah, for a few reasons, Tom. One is that when the BOJ moves, global markets feel the impact. And we've seen this a number of times over the years. In fact, even pre-COVID, it happened on a couple occasions. So if and when the BOJ does back away from the 25 basis point target, you'll see a very strong ripple effect, maybe even more than that, going into U.S. markets, German markets, et cetera. So that could have a pretty big effect, a lot of volatility, push up longer term U.S. rates. That's the biggest thing. It also affects terms of trade, of course, but really I'd say the interest rate impacts the big one. Mike, is there a buy point for the BOJ? It's clearly not 140. We're through it. Is it 145? Is it 150? What kind of numbers are you thinking about? Yeah, John, it's, it's interesting. At this point, I'd say it's we're almost in another region, so it's pretty difficult to say, hey, we've been here five times in the last 12 years. Here are the sort of entry points that work. Something north of 145 probably makes sense, but confidence level right now is very, very low. So anyone who wants to scale in, I'd say you emphasize that, scale in. Don't try to pick the optimal point. You won't find it. Mike, given the concerns that people have about rates rising in the euro region, particularly because of trying to finance the deficit, of the issue in Japan that's going to lead to a lack of buyers for U.S. Treasuries and the own U.S. inflationary issues, are you pushing back against the consensus trade of a couple of months ago to buy duration? 
Yeah, we think it's premature, Lisa, and it's interesting, and I think you do have to segment it market by market. So take a look at the pricing in the Eurozone right now, for instance. The ECB is priced to hike something like 170 basis points over the balance of this year. Sounds pretty aggressive. What I think is really amazing and way off base is another 50 basis points in the first half of next year. Think about this scenario. Energy prices skyrocket. You've got a pretty nasty recession in the Eurozone cold winter, a lot of very unhappy people, and somehow the ECB is still hiking? I don't think so. So it seems to us that that's out of bounds. So maybe in that particular case, you could buy duration. But against that, think about the Fed. We've got the terminal rate for the Fed fund cycle now looking at 385, 390, something like that, probably too low. I suspect that's going to be well into the four, so would not buy duration in the U.S. So perhaps in Europe, not in the U.S. case. So just let's uh, hone in a little bit on what you just said. You think that the terminal rate is in the fours. Uh, and when do we reach that? You think it's going to be next year? And how long will we keep it there? No, I think it's going to be this month. So in terms of the market pricing for the terminal rate, the market will bump that up probably after the SEP 21 meeting. But I think to your point, so how far out does the market think the Fed is going to conclude tightening? It's probably somewhere in the March to June. 23 range, but as far as the expectation, that happens very soon. The reality of the Fed pushing it there probably is six, nine months down the road. Has this been priced into the equity market? Hmm. Probably leave that to my colleague Chris Harvey, but I will say that generally speaking, when you've got central banks tightening pretty aggressively and QT, it's not a great recipe for risk. I love that when the bond strategist is just like, I I'm not going to justify this craziness <laughs> in the equity market. That's literally what he just as, did. That's Chris Harvey, <laughs> Mike Schumacher and Wells Fargo. Mike, good to catch up. Didn't we hear that from Bruce Cashman? from JP Morgan this morning. I, I was being so, so polite when Bruce was on. <laughs> Bruce was talking up the prospect of unemployment going through 5%. He was talking up the prospect of a much deeper downturn. I was sitting there just thinking, as he told Marco, does Marco <laughs> Kalanovic, does he know this? Lisa, based on what Bruce Kasman's saying about the economy. Are you saying that Marco just sits at a table by himself and I've got, everybody I've got else no is idea about no. the inner workings of the <laughs> investment bank over there. I'm just saying Bruce Kasman was talking up 5% unemployment to get inflation back down. That's not the uh, bullish equity market fairy tale we've been told. In fairness, taking a step back, you are seeing disagreement within shops, pretty, uh, pretty violent disagreement, which is healthy considering the fact that it's really hard to know what's going to happen and it's hard to know what's getting priced in. That said, hard to see how a four and a half percent interest rate in the U.S. priced in this month is really getting priced into the equity markets and let alone the credit markets. Well, you asked the equity market question, so let's stick on it. That's the U.S. Let's talk about Europe. We're still off the lows of early July. As far as I can see, July 5th, still off the lows on the DAX. Haven't retested them just yet, Lisa. And I think we can all sit here and say that over the last six weeks, things have got worse, not better right. in Europe relative to what people were expecting six weeks ago. There has been some support from some of the energy producers in Europe, right, that the shares have done better. And that's sort of something that has offset some of the pain in others. But it raises a good question, right? Are people basically already pricing in the bottom of something that hasn't transpired yet, even as other people say, we're looking at the worst case scenario? This is a really difficult moment for the Europeans. And Lisa, to build on something that Mike Schumacher said moments ago, Tom, if the ECB has to back away from rate hikes, I keep going back to this question, and Lisa and I have gone back and forth online, offline about it in the FX market. Does that help the currency? Or does that harm well, that's the currency? The ambiguity. No, that's really well said, John. There's a lot of these movements, folks, there's ambiguity. There's, that, that's the mathiness of whether the line goes one way or the other. John, it's a region at war. And when the facts change, they will change, and Christine Lagarde and the leadership will have to deal with it. I would suggest what you will see is currencies give way and what the Germans fear most, which is inflation up, whether it's nominal or real. I go back, and, and with Sebastian Malaby, this is my first question, on real incomes. The heritage of Europe, John, and declining real incomes is totally different than the new world optimism of America. We're going to catch up with Sebastian Malavi, the senior fellow for international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. Next, I believe, from New York City, with futures up a half of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up a third of 1%. There is an ECB rate decision coming up later this week on Thursday. And as that news conference is ongoing, Chairman Powell is going to speak at a monetary policy conference at 9.10 Eastern time. And the coordination here is bizarre. Today? It's Sorry. just bizarre. No, Thursday, Tom. Oh, Thursday. At the same time as the ECB news conference. Yeah, wow. Makes sense of that. Future's up, a half of 1%. This is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The U.S. Justice Department is deciding what to do next in the case of those documents taken from Donald Trump's home. A federal judge has granted the former president's request that a special master, a neutral third party, be appointed to review the documents. The judge also temporarily blocked the U.S. from using the documents in its criminal investigation. The Justice Department hasn't said whether it will appeal. In the UK, incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss has drafted plans to freeze energy bills for British households at or below the current level. According to documents seen by Bloomberg, the freeze could cost as much as $150 billion over the next 18 months. Truss is also planning a $46 billion support package to lower energy bills for businesses. In Canada, one of the suspects in the stabbing deaths of 10 people has been found dead. Authorities said that Damien Sanderson's wounds were not self-inflicted. They also believe the second suspect, Sanderson's brother, Miles, also is injured. The stabbings took place in the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. In China, lockdowns are spreading as a result of an increase in coronavirus coronavirus cases. Parts of the southern city of 6 million Giang have been sealed off after it reported new cases. Meanwhile, the city of Chengdu has extended a stay-at-home order for its 21 million residents through Wednesday. And shares of Bed Bath & Beyond are plunging today following the death of CFO Gustavo Arnold. He fell to his death from a Manhattan skyscraper on Friday. He was one of the Bed Bath & Beyond executives who provided details last Wednesday on the company's turnaround plan. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. But we do, I think, have to get people back into the real world post-COVID. Uh, and a reminder that the government cannot solve every problem, does not have uh, a bottomless pit of money. In the long run, uh, the only way to protect our standard of living, um, protect people's welfare, is to ensure higher levels of productivity and strong economic growth. From one crisis to another in the UK, that was Philip Hammond, the former UK Chancellor from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive, just about up a half of 1% on the S&P, bouncing back from three weeks of losses on the Nasdaq 100, up four-tenths of 1%. Yields higher, Tom, up six basis points. Your tenure, 325.57. Very good. Right now, a three-hour conversation that Lisa John and I would like to have with Sebastian Malaby, he's Senior Fellow for International Economics at CFR. And very importantly, John, and I was just going through the Winslow Homer show at the Met, and there was a painting owned by one S. Druckenmiller. It was a beautiful imagery of the Caribbean. I can't quite remember it. But anyways, I think, John, Druckenmiller won that painting in the Soros Druckenmiller <laughs> of 30 years ago today, as Sebastian reminds us. And, John, all I can say is that's the arch fear, not to be doom and gloom, but that's the arch fear for next year is the United Kingdom unravels. Hey, can we build on this just for a second, Tom, Please. because I think it's so important. It's always described as the Soros trade that broke the Bank of England, but it's pretty well known and well reported by now that the architect for the trade was right. Stanley Druckenmiller. It was George Soros that taught Druckenmiller, so the story goes, to bet big, Tom, to go huge, to put the whole fund on something when you had right. conviction. But the original architect, I believe, was Druckenmiller himself, which is pretty cool when you look back all those years. Well, we note the 30 years uh, here of uh, three decades, I should say, Unreal and the tensions time. that are out there now. Sebastian Malaby, thank you for joining us here. Does Liz Truss face dynamics like the United Kingdom faced 30 years ago? Well, there's one huge difference, uh, Tom, which is that back in 1992, uh, Sterling was part of the European exchange rate mechanism and that created one of these asymmetric bets for Druckenmiller and Soros, where um, they knew that sterling was not going to rise. It was sort of at the bottom of the permitted band in the exchange rate mechanism at the time. And because Britain was in a recession, the Bank of England was going to keep rates as low as it could get away with. Right. So if sterling was to rise right. a little bit, it wouldn't rise more. But if it crashed out of the ERM, it could go down 15 percent in one shot. And that's what created this totally asymmetric bet. That's why. Uh, George Soros said to Druckenmiller famously, go for the jugular on this, put more money on, more money on. And, you know, they were both up all night trying to find counterparties to put more positions on so that they could get that billion dollar profit when sterling did crack. This time, 
today, you know, the pound floats. It's already down um, a huge amount. It's down to levels of right. 1985. So it's adjusted gradually. There isn't one single breaking point, and that creates right. a very different dynamic. As a kid, Sebastian, you lived this. Your father was the United Kingdom ambassador to Germany, and it was a time of Deutsche Mark volatility, to say the least. Are you looking at the currency markets as being the release valve for a system buffeted by a war in Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I think um, flexible exchange rates are playing their intended role of being uh, shock absorbers. Right now, the U.S. is in somewhat better shape than Europe. It's further away from Ukraine. It's less exposed to the inflation. So the U.S. can um, have a very strong dollar, therefore absorb uh, foreign uh, imports more. Um, and that's going to be a bit of a benefit for the rest of the world. China is in the dumps, and so it's not playing that role. Um, and meanwhile, you know, Britain, which is in a very weak position because of um, uncertainty over huge gas price rises, um, baked in inflation, Goldman Sachs predicting 22% inflation coming up in the UK. So these are dire straits. Um, but because sterling has already fallen a lot, uh, it gives some release in terms of a stimulus to exports from Britain, an attraction for foreigners to come into the UK property market because everything is so <clears> cheap. And that is somewhat of a stabilizing factor. Sebastian, have you framed these numbers yet from Liz Trust? 170 billion sterling to offset some of the energy pain. Have, have you thought much about how big that is, actually is, the scale of that, and what it could mean for respective bond markets across Europe? Yeah, I mean, we've come out of this, uh, you know, COVID shock of enormous fiscal response to a public health emergency, and now we're going right back into a, a new kind of shock, an energy price shock, um, which is going to call forth another round of enormous stimulus. I haven't got the numbers in my head as to whether this, these hundred and something billion that people are banding around, we don't know for sure what the numbers are going to be yet because the speech will come on Thursday, I believe. Uh, but um, whether it's bigger or smaller than the, the, the COVID fiscal response, I'm not clear, but it's, it's cumulative, right? We've already got a position of huge public debt because we've come out of COVID. Um, and now we're going to lay on more, and it's not clear what you know how much the markets are willing to finance. Now, at some price, if sterling depreciates even more, I guess foreigners will come in and buy UK assets and plug the funding gap. Um, but it, it may take you know an even weaker pound for that to happen. Sebastian, back in the pandemic, policy from fiscal authorities and monetary authorities complemented each other. This time, it feels like it's in conflict. What do you think the consequences right. will be for things like growth, inflation, with these kind of dynamics? Yeah, I mean, that's a super important point, because, as you say, in COVID, we had the era of magic money, as I called it in a foreign affairs essay, meaning that there was this assumption inflation wasn't going to be there. So you could have both fiscal and monetary stimulus, and you were not afraid of being punished in terms of high inflation. Now, clearly, that's totally reversed. High inflation is a reality. So central banks have to raise rates. So we're in a situation where you're getting fiscal stimulus on the one hand in Europe, but at the same time, the ECB this Thursday is going to raise euro interest rates. And the Bank of England is going to have to tighten too. Uh, and so you've got, as you say, the two engines pulling against each other, and that's going to create more of a stop-start experience, and it's going to be tougher. Sebastian, do you consider this as a one-off winter, or do we have to gear up for a repeat act next year and maybe even the year after that? Well, I'm pessimistic in terms of, like, the geopolitics of the war. I do think that neither side has an off-ramp. Ukraine cannot accept the idea that it, it, it lost the territory after February the 24th in a permanent way, so it's determined to win that back. And there have been these atrocious war crimes in Mariupol, and, and no Ukrainian leader can just say, well, that's OK, we're going to negotiate. On the other hand, Putin is not the kind of person who's going to lose face easily. So I think the war to answer that part of the question, could go on uh, indefinitely. It could be a very long process. On the other hand, we have to remember that with the inflation shock that results from the war, you do get these base effects. So the first round is that you know energy prices spike up. That creates inflation. Um, but they're not going to spike up further from the spike. At some point, in, yeah. indeed, we've seen that in markets. They start to come back down. So because of these base effects, I don't think inflation is an ongoing double winter kind of problem. Sebastian, this was a clinic, and it's a conversation we need to continue very soon. Sebastian Malaby there of the Council on Foreign Relations. TK, a very, very different policy picture this time around. 
to two years ago. Yeah, again, the, the separation here for me, John, is the war in Ukraine. Angela Stent writing in the centennial edition of Sebastian Malvi's Foreign Affairs. It's simple, a brutal essay on Vladimir Putin. And Peter Schiff Academy just publishing Wake Me Up When September Ends. <laughs> She's, he's not alone. No. From New York, this is Bloomberg. There's still a lot of resilience in this labor market. Obviously, the inflationary regime has surprised the Fed. It surprised the bond market. And we continue to see those surprises. I think it's a challenging environment for equities. If we get a, a slowdown into the fall, which is my belief, then you will start to okay. see more relief. I think we'll have a recovery in 2024, but it's just too early to say, well, this is the time where the bear market is over. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keane. An exceptionally busy Tuesday morning. A new prime minister in the United Kingdom, but in the markets, a new currency regime. John? And I think we've got to join the two, Tom. We've got a weaker currency in Japan. We've had more recently a weaker currency in the UK. The why? Because there's going to be a big fiscal effort, Tom, and there's a big question about how they're going to finance it through higher yields to attract foreign investors or through a weaker currency and or both. And that's the problem they've got, TK, in Europe and the UK too. Extra data checks here in this hour. Lots going on here, particularly the linkage here of bonds, higher yields, lower bond prices and currencies. But, John, it does come back to a resilient United States. Chairman Powell speaking Thursday. He's in the way of another economic event. Yeah, and as far as I was aware, Tom, they were starting the ECB news conference a little bit later to accommodate the U.S. data, and then they start it later, and the chairman's going to speak in the middle of it. So I'm not sure how helpful that is, but yeah. as things stand, we get an ECB decision on Thursday, then we get a news conference, and somewhere within that news conference, you hear from Chairman Powell separately. Tom, right now, the U.S. has energy issues, just nothing like the energy issues in Europe. And for that matter, there's a very, very difficult set of issues that the Europeans have to face that the U.S. does not. And I wonder how that shapes people's perceptions, opinions, forecasts, Tom, right. of U.S. growth relative to, say, Europe, which is also much more leveraged to a much, much weaker China over the last six months. And the caution that I'm hearing, folks, here this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance, Lisa, to me, it all redounds back to a real income and real economy analysis. And what I don't understand is if you have a given inflation, whatever Bruce Kasman level, real incomes go down. Real incomes are plunging, and even more so in the euro region, where the labor market wasn't as strong as in the United States, and you didn't see the same kind of fiscal <clears throat> response. How does that factor into the growth outlook, and how does that factor into the Bruce Kasman outlook for unemployment rates picking up to a much more uh, significant degree than people are currently forecasting? It's going to be just fascinating to see. John, I want to do one thing here before we jump in sure. uh, to the data, and that is to go to your United Kingdom and the symbolism of a new prime minister and as a total hack America in the crazy system, some people say she has a five-day window. What is that about? Yeah, forget the ceremonial stuff of today. <clears throat> she's got to come up with a plan. Some people think she's already come up with it. 130 billion sterling, Tom, to help freeze energy bills. That's one proposal. Here's another. A 40 <clears throat> billion sterling energy aid package for UK businesses. Yeah. So that's 170 in total. That's about 5% of GDP to address one winter. Tom, one winter. And that one winter could become two, and it could be a whole lot longer as well. And the question I'm asking, Lisa, too, and I know Guy Johnson in London is going to pick up on this a little bit later as well, can they repeat the act if they need to? Never mind pull up this one. Can they repeat right. the act if they need to? Oh, it's a political maelstrom. We'll continue to cover from 10 uh, down the street. John, let me begin the data check by simply sterling $4.52 long ago and far away, and now... 1.1573. Yeah, and 114 yesterday. So this is a turnaround, a stronger pound sterling today. Futures bouncing back to up three quarters of 1% a little bit earlier. That fades a bit, still up seven tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the NASDAQ 100, up six or seven tenths of 1%. Talked about those high yields at the long end now. Stay side, up five basis points on Treasuries, 324 on a 10 year. A little bit of calm in Europe after all the drama around Nord Stream 1 over the last couple of days. Euro dollar 99.24 were basically unchanged on the Session after having a little look at 98. Crude soft, the lower negative two tenths of 1% on WTI, Tom, $86 and about 70 cents. 
Right now, Victoria Green joins us, Chief Investment Officer, G-Squared Private Wealth. And what we're going to do here is dive into the idea of what do you actually do? How do you affect investment given all of the turmoil that's out there? Victoria, how valuable is cash right now? Cash is good. I'd rather sit in a very ultra short T-bill somewhere between zero and six months. You know, you're getting on the six month T-bill now, which has very limited duration or price risk. You're getting a 3.1, 3.2%. As this front end comes up, yes, if you look on a real basis, you're still losing versus inflation, but park it somewhere safe. And we do think cash as an allocation isn't a best, bad place to be. You know, one thing we do always advise, even when things feel very dark, panic is never a good investment strategy. And it, it's funny, you have very, very smart people that, that when we start to see these losses pile right. on, they just can't take it. Let me announce, uh, Victoria, with you my theme of the next 90 days in investment, <laughs> which is something I heard in the dregs of August, which is trying to find scale. You and I have three or four good ideas, but it's so hard now to get scale in investment to get belief across X number of equities, to get belief across different portfolios. How do you get scale if you got a fair amount of money? Well, what you want to do is, is you want to be in the right places. You know, I don't think diversification is dead, though I think it is amusing every time we see stress and volatility. You know, the VIX has remained low, but we saw assets become correlated. And honestly, I think it was the fixed income that surprised everybody this year. But I do think when you're looking at investing, you don't want to just say, I'm going to put a little bit in everything, because there are markets that are going to do a little bit better than others. Right now, we're, we're not very bullish on Europe or the UK. No offense, John, but there's a bit of a high wall. <laughs> they, have to, they have to work on over there. So I I prefer to be like, let's be a little more concentrated. U.S. blue chips, value, dividends. Put your stocks where you're going to have a, a little bit of a bunker mentality and then work your way back out into risk. We're never black and white. We're not a hedge fund. We're not trying to long short and trade every single day. But if you were to look at the world, I'd say I would bunker in quality. I'd make sure you understand everything you own and what kind of risk you have in your portfolio. And then understand your time frame as an investor, because if, if you can wait it out six months, 12 months, it's going to be a Okay, it's just you have to emotionally get ready that maybe you shouldn't look at it every day and then definitely don't panic. And, and honestly, uh, panic is one of the, the biggest risks to investors right now. Let's say we go down four weeks in a row. Let's say we retest our 3,600 lows. Do you have the courage and conviction to hang on to your stocks? And the answer <clears throat> should be yes. Victoria, you know me. I don't take offense. I just draw the line at soccer versus football. Other than that, <laughs> fill your boots. Go for it. Criticize the young John, UK. she's some Texas A&M. John, she's a fighting Texas Aggie. I'm aware. Football this is, is the year. American this is football. Our year. Uh, you want to go there? I thought it was Bama's year again. No. We're going to do U.S. No. college football. No. We're not. Okay. I mean, look, it is. It is definitely a religion down here, and this year is A&M's year, 100% national championship. Okay, but well, I'm trying to get to a game down south later this year, so. Maybe we can sort that out. Victoria, I want yes. to talk about the pain and the pain still to come in your mind. If you do have a longer time horizon, I want to understand from your perspective where you expect the leadership to come from through the next cycle. Is it too premature, too early to make that call? I think we're still on the down end of the cycle. So this is a classic business cycle, right? We're going to have, we have expansion and right now we're not, you know, PMIs I think are going to reflect that and you're going to have this contraction. So during the contraction period, you want to be bunkered, you want to be in safe havens uh, and you look at defensive sectors, your health sectors, I know staples are a little expensive, so I'd be picky there. Utilities versus REITs have done well. And I still don't mind a little bit of energy. And one thing I think is fascinating about that part of the market is that energy prices or energy stocks have decoupled a little bit from, from oil prices. So we saw in August WTI pull back about 8-9%, but the energy sector was actually still positive in August. And I think a lot of that is the way U.S. energy companies are giving back to shareholders, their, their dividends, their fixed plus variable dividends, their buybacks. Um, so even at 86, you know, we think well, there's a lot of very profitable energy companies. And the U.S. is now becoming an energy exporter. I think we exported something like 10 million barrels of refined product just last week. We're doing about a million barrels of gasoline. Uh, and so we're seeing this continued demand and you're going to see the push pull in demand uh, as we see recessions typically are, are bad for, for gasoline demand that the China issue uh, it, are they shutting down again you know sometimes it feels like Groundhog Day like we can't get out of this oh we've got shutdowns we've got COVID we've got demand issues 
And then when everything feels terrible, that's when you want to start buying some growthy things and some longer duration equities. But you, you don't necessarily want to hold a ton of higher beta, higher risk stocks right now. Victoria, just quickly here, have the large cap U.S. stocks priced in European recession and the strong dollar? I think so. The strong dollar, yes. You know, and if you look at, you know, we're, we're kind of playing again Groundhog Day. What, what pulled the markets down through that first, second quarter was the strong U.S. dollar uh, and the Fed raising rates. And, and then the dollar pulled back some and commodities have pulled back some. But you still have a huge headwind. I think the recession in Europe and the energy crisis that is brewing is something investors cannot ignore. We are not an isolated nation. We're interdependent with each other. And as you guys were talking about earlier on the show, this may be a crisis that drags on. It is going to be very difficult to replace the amount of gas that is needed over the winter and then potentially to do it on a go forward basis. We're even drawing down our SPR. It's as low as possible to the strategic petroleum reserves. Ever since we started building it up in the 70s and 80s, we are now back down to levels we haven't seen. So how long can these Band-Aids continue? Uh, we'll have to see. Victoria, thank you. <coughs> Always good to catch up. Victoria Green there of G Squared Private Wealth. Often a mistake, Tom, sometimes a mistake to extrapolate out the negativity currently yes. at several years, but it's worth a conversation. No, Are we ready a, to talk about this next winter, the winter yeah, after no, that? No, I, I, I think you're dead on, and it, it frankly comes back to the war. I mean, the idea, I, I still love, John, how certain media are, like, counting the days of the war. Sure. It feels like the first battle of Bull Run, which is the American experiment. John, I, I, I totally take your point on the extension of this, and I just wonder the separateness of America this morning. Let me look at yen. See, it's 142-ish, 141.92. John, Texas A&M at Alabama, October Very 8th. cool. There very cool. How do we get tickets for that? Is it difficult? I, I, I hear it's very, very difficult. I think the, the only one I know in our orbit that could get tickets for that, Kaylee Lines, is Maybe so wired. Maybe she could hook that up. She is so wired. Is in. she, Tom? Let's work that she, out. She's just Let's work that out. I hear that's the closest you get. To European football in terms of atmosphere. I need to go to a college game in the South. Am I right, Bama? Honestly? Am I? UVA is not Alabama. I'm just saying, Virginia. Well, no, she likes college football. Okay. Though. All Katie right. Likes all right. College all right. Football. So perhaps she can get a UVA in. connection. Okay. It's just she likes college football. <laughs> okay. Good, good clarification. And, and that, Lisa, given <laughs> yes. where the bar is for this show in college football, <laughs> that's got that right. <laughs> above where we are at. But she likes it, and maybe she's a little bit more dialed in. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Up three quarters of one percent on the S and P <laughs> from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The Justice Department is considering whether to appeal a judge's decision regarding documents seized from Donald Trump's home in Florida. The judge has granted the former president's request to have a special master, that is a neutral third party, review the papers. The judge, who was appointed during the Trump administration, also temporarily blocked the government from using the documents in its criminal investigation. Liz Truss officially becomes the UK's next Prime Minister today after winning the Conservative Party's leadership contest. And she's drafting plans to aid households and businesses with their soaring energy bills. The proposals could cost close to $200 billion. European leaders are scrambling for emergency fixes to an energy crisis that is getting worse. In Germany, the government reversed policy and moved to keep two nuclear power plants alive. They'll be kept in reserve in case they're needed for this winter only. Meanwhile, Germany has agreed to export more electricity to France. The French will send gas to Germany when it's needed. The drugstore chain CVS keeps expanding beyond its retail origins. The company has reached a deal to buy home health and technology services provider Signify Health for about $8 billion in cash. Other bidders included Amazon and United Health. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. They can't afford another winter like this. It's simply impossible to um, politically be allow allowing that to happen. So they're going to have to invest in supply, alternative supplies, whether it's renewable, whether it's nuclear. I know nothing of that is immediate and nothing's going to be fast. It's going to have to be a combination of demand destruction. But demand destruction is also politically un unpalatable because it essentially means you need to create a recession. More trouble brewing, more trouble brewing. Kona Hack there, the head of research at ED and F-Man from New York City.
Good morning, Tom Keane. Lisa Brambert and Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up around 80 points, up 6 or 7 tenths of 1%. Euro dollar unchanged at 99.29. Here comes another one. It's Evercore. The rising likelihood of a 75 basis point hike from the ECB. Quote, it's probably now the more likely outcome. Tom, join a club. There's so many people well, lining up looking for 75 this Thursday. The weight there, we're going to stop there, John. This is really important. The weight there is Edward Hyman, who I'm told is looking for us to get back to 4% and then what inflation. Krishna Guha leading the coverage here, Tom, alongside Peter Williams. Yeah. And then what, you're right. The then what next year, if you get the kind of demand destruction that Kona's talking about right. in the European economy, Tom, then what for the ECB? That's right where I wanted to go. Joining us now, the historian and head of hydrocarbons for all of Bloomberg, Will Kennedy, joins us this morning uh, in London. Will, to round this out, and I'm sorry that you know we missed you on your trip to Balmoral this morning. Uh, Will, to round this out, the arch fear here looking at Rotterdam coal, which you and Javier Bloss look at by the minute, is a United Kingdom that returns to the agony of the 1920s and the 1930s, that time of real income slowdown. Is that a reality given the energy impulse there so different than America that we could see in the United Kingdom a legit long-term real income decline? It, it, it was happening. I mean, when you're faced with utility bills tripling, uh, you're going to see a people's real incomes plummet and plummet very fast. But what's happened this morning is the new Prime Minister, uh, Liz Truss, who has gone to Balmoral to be appointed Prime Minister by the Queen today. Uh, she, it looks like, and our, our politics reporter Alex Wickham reported this morning, that she is going to introduce a huge intervention into the energy market to cap bills at where they are today. Uh, it's going to cost well over £100 billion. Um, but what that will do is it will prevent the worst of that real income slowdown. Um, and it will perhaps take some of this thing out of inflation. Well, it helps the energy companies, and it's not targeted in any way, shape or form. Will, when you have conversations with your team, with your contacts, your sources, are you thinking about the prospect of the need to do this twice, not once? I mean, that's the problem. The great flaw in this plan, of course, is that if you just cap energy prices, you do nothing to address the demand problem. And you had Kona Hack talking about demand destruction having to be part of the solution. Uh, politicians have set targets across Europe to reduce demand 15%. We haven't really had that conversation in the UK. And if you don't let prices rise, people keep using um, energy as they have been. And that means that, you know, prices and demand are likely to stay high and the bill uh, will come in higher and higher. What happens in the spring? Well, we don't know where we'll be. We don't know where we'll be in terms of Russia, in terms of pipelines, in terms of the broader economy. But clearly, by offering the support now, it's going to become a pretty open-ended promise because you're not suddenly going to want to triple prices in a year's time. We're only two years away from election in Britain. If you take a look at the Twitter comments on some of the plans and the potential wrath uh, inflicted upon the pound as a response, people say it's Brexit's fault. And this is a direct result of Brexit, that the situation has gotten as dire in the UK, even relative to the rest of the European region. Is that accurate? How much does that and the lack of the uh, interdependency of the two regions really play into the energy story here? I don't think it's a huge issue in the energy story. I mean, it may be a part of the, weak, the broader weakness in the pound may well be to do with Brexit. But when we specifically talk about energy, uh, the energy markets remain as interconnected as they have been before Brexit. We still have big gas and power uh, connectors between the UK and the EU. And um, they're still working. I think people overcomplicate this issue sometimes, talking about the energy transition. And, you know, at the end of the day, this energy crisis is happening across Europe because Vladimir Putin took the decision to stop supplying gas to Europe. Well, and, and also, that, as at you the know, end of the day, is the bottom line. It's the policy response to that war that has exacerbated these yep. issues. So it's not the war per se, it's the policy response to it. When you look at the support in general across Europe right now, across countries and within electorates, are you seeing any fragmentation, any breakdown in that support for the policy response to this war? Well, we have seen some protests over the weekend, most notably perhaps in the Czech Republic. Uh, I think that it is a key concern of policymakers. They realise that it's going to be a tough winter and they've got to find the policies to get through it and to bring their populations with them. And that's why you're seeing the kind of interventions that you're seeing from Liz Truss's new government, but also that we saw over the weekend from Olaf Scholz's Olaf Scholz government in Germany, where right. they uh, had a package of sort of 60-odd billion euros. France has already capped prices. 
as I've said before when we've talked, right. you know, the answer here is a huge fiscal intervention. It's now happening. You right. can see it happening. John, to you and to great respect to Will as well. John, is Prime Minister Truss a war prime minister? Well, Tom, there's a war, but she's not directly engaged in it, is she, Tom? Would you say the UK is at war with Russia right now? I, Would you say that? I think you can say a war time. There's a war in Europe it's taking place in Ukraine. Version. We'll carry on. Please jump in. I think what we're seeing this week, and the way I would describe it, is that we are seeing an economic war between the West and Russia and, and an energy war. And we've seen that escalate this week with the price cap idea on Friday and the, and the response of shutting out Nord Stream. And I think both sides of working out how to get through the winter and how that war plays out through the winter. On the one hand, Russia is making a bet that the pain will be so great that they will break European resolve. On the other hand, European governments are marshalling their balance sheets to bring huge financial power to bear to get them until the spring. It's a high it's stakes, going to be an amazing, ugly, yeah, ugly blinking contest, Will, that's for sure, if we can all, all also trivialise it that way. Uh, Will, you're just one of the best, and I love catching up with you, mate. You know that. Will Kennedy, thank you, sir, out of London. Mm -hmm. Bramo, it's expensive. It's going to be difficult to do it once. It's going to be much, much harder to try and do this twice. And the reason why I mentioned Brexit is because the reason why the currency can be the pressure valve is because it is not part of the European region trying to assess this in real time together. And it never was part of the euro, but still it, it's relevant in the isolation of the UK economy at a time when the dependency, the interdependency could be helpful in terms of scale. I'm going to see different approaches here, Lisa to address in this issue. And the latest from Liz Trust is she just goes for the blanket big one. 130 billion for consumers and 40 billion for businesses. We'll see if they're the numbers, if that's the plan. But you said this. Okay, let's say that's the plan now. What happens if they have to do a redux of this in a year? What then? You'd have to imagine it's slightly different and revolves around demand destruction in a much more material way. See which way Europe goes to on this. It's already getting very expensive, Tom. Do we see a chance of the exchequer today? No idea, actually, Tom. Yeah. Hopefully in the next 24 hours we get some more detail on that. Futures up 7 tenths from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures. Positive 23, up six tenths of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1%. Josh Wingrove down in D.C. here at Bloomberg put this tweet out moments ago. The president is planning a celebration of the Inflation Reduction Act next week on the same day that August CPI data comes out. <laughs> so there you go. Look ahead to that. I believe September 13th, Tom, is when we get that CPI data for the month of August. And it's going to be very important. I mean, you know, John, we haven't talked about this at all, but off the jobs report, I mean, frankly, the inflation report is equally as important. Oh, without a doubt. You know. The Fed chairman oh, talked about zero. the totality of the data, Tom, yeah. whatever that means. And the totality of the data over the last week has been better than expected across the board, actually. I think claims lower than expected. Right. The ISM <clears> was better than expected. Consumer confidence was more robust. The jobs report was pretty solid. Take your pick, Tom. We drive to Thursday, and there will be an ECB meeting. It is always good to have John Farrell with us because he's got a little bit of experience with the three-hour lunches in Frankfurt. Is there going to be a three-hour lunch in Frankfurt for that critical meeting, John? I think they probably need it to go a little bit longer. Five-hour lunch. <laughs> we'll they need a drink see. after this one if we get that 75 basis point hike. I did not I, expect on, that. Six months ago, three months ago, even a month ago, didn't expect to move that big. Still unimaginable. I give a nominal GDP in the animal spirit of Europe in a war. Wow. Yeah, I agree. It'll be interesting to see. We'll march to Thursday on that data. Right now, we march to a bigger view of the math of this foreign exchange market. Eric Nelson is out of the exquisite math economics uh, program at Wake Forest. He's with Wells Fargo as their macro strategist. Eric, thank you so much for joining us on short notice. For those of you on radio, his gorgeous telecaster is noted in the background. Eric, I want to yeah. talk to you about a shift that always happens under crisis in foreign exchange, fixed or floating. We go from a rate analysis, a relative rate analysis, to looking at flows. When do flows matter for, in the news, the United Kingdom? I think we're already there, Tom, especially with the UK, but also in Europe. Of course, you have the well-documented balance of payments situation in the UK, an ever-expanding current account balance. And this continues to be a problem as we start to see more fiscal measures 
uh, from the UK, from Europe. We start to see fiscal uh, concerns return in the UK, which we haven't seen for a long time, and Europe as well. So this is really going to hinge on, uh, you know, what can fiscal, fiscal authorities do in these regions? And also we have to think about backstops. The ECB, uh, the famous uh, transmission protection instrument, will that be discussed at this week's meeting? I think that will become an ever-increasing focus for the FX right. market. Chris Watling from Longview Economics writes up a dissertation on this in the FT this morning. And I, I would suggest, Eric, that people ignore flows. They ignore balance of payments. It's some heavy lifting academically. In Japan, it has to be like a teeter-totter flat on the ground. I, I mean, Japan is basically a broken foreign exchange theme, isn't it? I think that's right, Tom. And, and, and there's not enough focus, in my opinion, on Japan's energy, energy situation. Look at the cost of a cargo swap of LNG, uh, the JKM benchmark. That's gone up about 400% year over year. We talk a lot about Europe and UK energy prices surging. Japan is, is also competing for the LNG and is having a very difficult time. So right now, the yen weakness is as much about the central bank and the macro as it is the energy. And increasingly, we'll see it become more of an energy story. Eric, how far can the dollar strengthen before it becomes a massive liability to the one perhaps stalwart economy amid a sea of pain? This is such an important question, Lisa. I'm glad you brought it up. And we look back to the, the mid-1980s, the Plaza Accord, coordinated FX intervention. We've got a long way to go, I think, in terms of levels before the Fed, the Treasury start to get worried. Right now, the, the dollar strength is, is as much a good thing as it is a bad thing. Um, but fast forward six, nine months, euro maybe at 90 cents, dollar yen at 150, U.S. manufacturing starting to, to really look weak. Maybe the calculus changes and we start to talk about coordinated intervention. I, I don't think we can rule this out. So, Eric, you rolled off these numbers that are actually gaining some traction in other places. Jordan Rochester putting out some similar kinds of targets, that 90 euro mark also uh, emerging, 150 for the Japanese yen. I'm trying to wrap my head around how disorderly those moves could be. I mean, are these pretty violent moves that you see or just a slow grind, weaker and weaker and weaker versus the dollar? Well, for dollar yen, Lisa, it's, it's been violent so far, and I have to wonder at what point the MOF and the BOJ really come to their uh, to an agreement here on, on wanting to step in. It's, it's been, you know, essentially ten big figures in the span of a month uh, or so, and, and I think you could see some uh, some action here, and maybe in the next couple of weeks if this continues at this pace. For euro, I, I think it will be more of a grind, and, and as we see more crisis conditions unfold, we start to get a sense of what the implications are here, but. This could unfold over several months. Eric, when you talk about the prospect of coordinated intervention, you give much thought to what shape that takes. Is that just an empty statement at a G20 meeting? Is that something a little bit more bigger than that? What is it? Well, John, in some cases it could be uh, in, in relation to a specific currency. I think back to the late 1990s with dollar-yen. Uh, you know, the, the BOJ's efforts to stem yen weakness were largely futile until the Treasury and the Fed stepped in the U.S., and we had a pretty substantial reversal. So it could take that form. If it's especially concerning and we start to see, you know, food crisis, energy crisis really spiral here, then you, maybe you see the G7 get together and there's coordinated action, not just statement. And again, this is a tail risk scenario. If it happens, it won't happen for quite some time. But I don't think we can we can really uh, assume this won't happen. Well, Eric, the Europeans need a strong currency. They can't buy one. The UK need a strong currency. They can't buy one. This just feels like a US decision, doesn't it? Won't it just come down to the Treasury and Secretary Yellen to make that call? Uh, they'll, they'll probably be the most important player in those discussions. I think you also have to consider we're at, we're in, we're at war here. Uh, you know, on, on a global stage, economic uh, and actual warfare on yeah. the ground. So that will certainly factor into the calculus. John, I just want to point out that Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo is driving yen to new weakness as we speak right now, 142.14. Well, the problem is, Tom, we've, we've gone through 140. And when we we're in the 130s, we were asking the question, is 140 the buying point to get the BOJ to lean the other way? And, Eric, once you go through 140 and you don't hear a whisper, it does open up 150. Is that kind of the way you think about it? Yeah, at a certain point, you start to just test the BOJ. And, and what's interesting is you go back to the late 90s, and what the BOJ actually did was they waited for a pullback in dollar-yen and then really stepped on the gas and intervened, trying to make a, an even larger move as opposed to 
sort of pushing on a string. We could see that happen here um, over the next couple of weeks. Eric, when you talk about a coordinated action and the fact that it really has to be the U.S.'s decision, it hinges on when it becomes more painful for the U.S. to have a strong dollar uh, than it is to possibly coordinate some action. What is that level? I don't know if it's so much a level, Lisa, as it is uh, the broader conditions surrounding dollar strength. You start to see, let's say, some more emerging market crises. Uh, again, the, the food and, and energy situation become more concerning globally. The Fed and Treasury are very aware that the, the global price of the U.S. dollar is one of the most important factors in the global macroeconomic environment. So huge. And, and I think that if you're looking at a, a very precarious global situation, even more yeah. precarious than we're in now, um, the Fed may have to do something. Well, Eric, come on. Let me get you in trouble here with your general counsel this morning. Are we looking at EM fragility out of the 90s? I'll let you pick your vintage, or is this time different? Well, every every crisis is different, right, Tom? But so so far, it's been mostly contained. And I look at the Chiles and the Argentinas and the Turkeys as being probably, in the, as usual, among the most vulnerable. I don't think we're at a point yet where we're worried about defaults in, in these these types of regions, but at least downgrades. Um, and, 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 of course, um, if the pain continues, then eventually you start to get worried about balanced payments. But we're, we're not quite there yet. Eric, awesome to catch up. <laughs> Eric, and I want to again you. give you the, the shout out for the parity call you made earlier this year before it was really in fashion and before we were that close to getting there. Congratulations on that call earlier this year. Thank you. Eric Nelson there joining us from <clears throat> Wales. Tom, it was a big call from him and the team. And we hit parity and cleaned our way through it yeah, well, pretty quickly. And, and, and other people, I, I think, with the same call as well. And, of course, the people going the other way have been quieted. We need to remember, John, it's not just so much the vector. It's the speed of move, the size of move. The phrase that's used is big figures, and it's a big figure time for foreign exchange. We've settled down, I think, with the euro, at least for now, at least at 99.26. But we have, Tom. We went through parity how long ago? Yeah. Been in and around that kind of level. Are we settled down waiting parity. for the meeting, the ECB meeting? Waiting to see what yeah. happens next, and we're waiting for that next catalyst, Lisa. Well, and will it, a 75 basis point rate hike, this perhaps will be the tell, will it support the euro? Will it actually create a little pop, or won't it? And if it doesn't support the euro, then what? And I really do think that could be a catalyst in and of itself. This idea hiking into weakness isn't enough to give a, a boost to a currency that is responding more to economic outlook than it is to monetary policy. What did you make of that call on the prospect of coordinated intervention? I think it's a tricky one at a time when, as Eric was saying, the U.S. is doing okay. When does the pain in the rest of the world become strong enough for the U.S. to respond more than to the inflationary outlook than is driving polls, driving sentiment, driving the economy? Nearly everybody wants a strong currency. Not everyone can have one. Right. Who wants to give up that strength if they've got it? I'm not sure anyone wants to do that right now, given the inflation backdrop. Tom, maybe that picture changes in 12 months' time. My response to the BOJ, you oh, can imagine hey. how this conversation goes. We need some help. Well, tell your central bank to do something about it. Tom, isn't that the first stop? <clears throat> yeah, well, the central bank's going to provide leadership, and critically, John, they're going to be ex post completely data dependent, and that even folds into the politics. What does the governor of the Bank of England do given a new prime minister that, by some reports, has a five-day window to act. That's, that's not in the textbooks. I would say that the projections that came from Governor Bailey and the team last time around did not include £170 billion exactly. pounds worth of aid to a, a offset war. the energy issues. She's a war Jim Kerrin's going to join us from Morgan Stanley shortly. Brian Nick of Nuveen, Amy Wu Silverman of RBC to guide you through the opening bell. We'll kick that conversation off in about 19 minutes' time on Bloomberg TV. Live from New York on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. It's official, Liz Truss has become the new British Prime Minister. Queen Elizabeth II asked Truss to today to form a new government after she won the Conservative Party leadership race. The two met in Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Truss replaces Boris Johnson, who offered the Queen his resignation earlier in the day. The U.S. Justice Department is deciding what to do next in the case of those documents taken from Donald Trump's home. A federal judge has granted the former president's request that a special master 
a neutral third party be appointed to review the documents. The judge also temporarily blocked the U.S. from using the documents in its criminal investigation. The Justice Department hasn't said whether it will appeal. The Prime Minister of Ukraine is confident that European leaders will keep sanctions on Russia despite the turmoil they face in energy markets. He spoke with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. We can see absolute understanding from European leaders that uh, we are in a hybrid war. We have absolute understanding that uh, Russia is uh, blackmailing European uh, politicians and we have absolutely assurement from uh, European politics that they will stay with Ukraine till the win. The Prime Minister also said Ukraine's allies should do what they can to help end the war quickly since Moscow is willing to keep fighting for a long period. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Unfortunately, good news in the labor market can be bad news because the Fed will have to respond uh, more. And so I think it's it's on a good path. But the Fed is still going to be debating 50 or 75 basis points. And I think it's going to end up by, you know, very close to four by the end of the year, if not at four, and then be, you know, hold with a four handle uh, through much of 2023. Leading our jobs coverage on Friday, the former governor of the Federal Reserve System, Randy Krosner of Booth School. He's been hugely valuable for us uh, over the years. Futures up 24, Dow futures up 200, the VIX 25.6 through 3. And right now on a Tuesday, Lisa, foreign exchange on the move, DXY just through 110, and yen can't get out of its way, weaker yen. A stunning 142.28. Just surging, uh, at least uh, taking a look at the dollar versus the yen. And what's the break point? We just were talking to Eric Nelson, talking about a 150. What would that do to the world currency order? Right now, bull, bear, gloom. Kriti Gupta joins us with a chart. Kriti, what do you have? Well, a lot of gloom, and it feels like the gloominess is just not abating when it comes to the stock market. That brings me to my chart of the day. Remember, we are starting uh, the fall season. We are coming af after Labor Day. The expectation here is that volume is really just going to pick up. The investors on the sidelines perhaps making those bets. But so far, Tom, if you look at this uh, chart for our radio audience, essentially we're looking at the bull, bear spread. It is just going down, down, down. It has <laughs> been for the last year or so, and really steepening lower in uh, the last Last month or so. The question here is, does that continue uh, ahead of a seasonally well, bearish month. September has been pretty horrible for the stock market, but just given uh, the selling that you've seen, maybe it'll reverse. Maybe this time will be the exception, Tom. Gupta channeling Abramowitz, the <laughs> toxic brew of chartdom <laughs> this morning. Right now, we're going to rip up the script, which you can always do with one B. Ritholtz. Masters in Business is the podcast. Barry Ritholtz with an important book out on the great financial crisis, but far more than that, in the trenches of looking at performance in investment. Earlier this morning, Benjamin Laidler was on from eToro, and we did not have time to get to his important note on the complete outperformance of index funds over active. It is absolutely stunning, Barry, to see ETFs double their size from 2018. It continues, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just an extension of a trend that dates back to the 2000s. My pet theory is between the analyst scandal and the accounting fraud and IPO spinning and all that mutual fund scandals, at a certain point, mom and pop just said, we've had enough. And, and they said, we don't want to play this game. Uh, the only way to win a game that you are up against a much smarter, stronger, better equipped opponent is to not play. And so they said, the hell with stock picking, we're just going to index. And it's been incredibly successful for them. It has been. And Barry, there is a question going forward to whether that will change or at least whether it will move to factors rather than simply broad based <laughs> indexes because of some of the idiosyncratic natures of the shocks that keep getting thrown at this market. Yeah, we keep hearing that every every time, you know, there's a long period of, of inflows to passive uh, and outflows from active, it's just wait for the next fill in the blank, ne just wait for the next recession, next uh, crash, next pullback. And, you know, it hasn't happened. 
this has been an unusually good year for active because half of active is slightly outperforming their their benchmarks uh but most of the time it, it's fairly less than that and so uh, you know maybe some factors are going to work their way in uh i spoke with eric balchunas who is the uh, bloomberg intelligence etf analyst and he covers a lot of passive and it seems the general trend is towards a core of passive maybe that's 50 60 70 percent with a bunch of very differentiated satellites whether it's arc or some factor fund small cap value whatever and that seems to be a big trend uh, amongst investors very I know that you're a stalwart of the buy and hold and be invested, stay invested in the broad market thesis. Right now we're facing shocks unlike what we have seen in decades. We are looking at a Japanese yen that is the weakest going back to 1998. We are looking at an energy crisis in Europe unrivaled in its recent history. How does that change your investing thesis? Well, remind me who forecast those events taking place and then position themselves in advance of it. Some tiny percentage of investors manage to get that right, but they're few and far between, and it's hard to see them doing that consistently over time. That's why a lot of what we call macro tourists constantly <clears throat> find themselves getting burned. Very often, these big macro events that people are trying to right. adjust around, it's already reflected in stock price. It's hard for any individual to beat the collective wisdom of the entire marketplace. There are trillions of dollars yeah. at risk very smart people, lots and lots of, of firepower put to work to do this, and very few people can. Barry, i got to leave it there. i got about eight more questions here on Active Passive. I think it's really <laughs> at a tipping point into 2023. I've said that before and been wrong, though, so i got to be careful uh, there. Barry Holtz, thank you so much. Of course, this podcast is a good value for you. It's back to work. It's after the summer. Get a new habit. Rit Holtz and his podcast is very, very important. Lisa, I really don't know where to begin, but I think I can make the statement. It's a little inflammatory. The yen is in free fall. It seems to be uh, falling pretty dramatically. It's the new uh, post-1998 low uh, versus the dollar purse low weakness. How much are we looking at some sort of breakdown in the in the system where there aren't a lot of levers to be pulled, right? And this is something that we've been talking about with the possibility that Eric Nelson raised and also Jordan Rochester of Namura of a 90 level on the euro <clears throat> versus well the dollar. Because where else is the uh, pressure yeah. going to be relieved? One of the advantages here, Lisa, it's in your world is the Bloomberg Total Return Index is the set of them. There's like eight, nine, ten of them are really valuable right now. And on price, we really haven't broken down to new higher yield, lower price. But oops, we're getting there. Maybe this week, maybe dovetailed into ECB. Well particularly on the short end of the curve. What you're seeing is a real bifurcation between the long end having some support and short-term rates seeing some of the biggest rises that they've seen in a coordinated action going back decades or ever. You know, And that's something that people are looking at. How much can the ECB raise rates by potentially, what, 175 mm -hmm. basis points by year end, which is what's being priced into the market before you get some sort of more significant disruption? Really can't convey how interesting across equities, bonds, currencies, and commodities the moment is. This is going to be very exciting tomorrow and into the ECB meeting on Friday. And who knows the news flow from the United Kingdom and from Tokyo as well. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us.